Okay, right. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 24 of Heresy Hammer. Um, today's a very special episode because we're joined by uh, yet a lovely, an- lula, another lovely guest, uh, this time in the form of uh, a true hobby hero, Kieran Douglas, uh, who will be better known to uh, many of you as Raptor Imperialis. Good morning, Kieran. Good morning. Uh, thanks for um, getting me on, guys. It's a great pleasure. So, um, many of you will be uh, familiar with Kieran. Many of you will also be familiar with my co-host Rob Meadows Miniatures. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, well, wonderful. We're doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I, yeah, like I said, my brain still hasn't woken up. And um, my name is John. You can find me on Instagram at D Six Miniatures. Um, we're here today to talk about Empress Children and pretty much nothing else. Actually, there's there's not. A huge amount of of news we had such a big kind of bumper news um episode last time out and there's not an awful lot to discuss other than the fact that the space wolf helmets briefly went away and then came back and came back and then we had but we did have the pre-order as we're recording this kind of on the on the sunday for pre-order we did have a, a vast array of heresy stuff to be able to get so like the siege of Cthonia book is coming out which i have no doubt we'll do lots of episodes on Two new yes. characters going to come out, so it's going to be an expensive week for uh, lots of people out there. I think. Oh, absolutely! But you know, it's always nice to uh, go spend your money on something, haven't you? Exactly right. And to be fair, I think the uh, the glorious emperor's children deserve their own episode anyway. Oh, oh of course. unsullied by any of the yes, legions. So I agree. It's all yeah. good. <laughs> well, without further ado, um, we shall get into. Uh, firstly, before we discuss the Empress Children, we should discuss our uh, our guest host. No, we won't. We've already fucking fucked this up. We only spent 10 minutes sorting this out before <laughs> we started, and I've already made a mistake straight away. We're actually going to start by talking about the Patreon because um it's been uh, as you may or may not know, we've been uh, we've been doing this for a for a whole year now. And it's wonderful to have received so uh much support from our patrons over on uh, Patreon. If you just nip over to patreon.com forward slash heresy hammer, you can find us on there. Um, we started, uh, the Patreon because, um, we kind of, you know, we wanted to make sure that this was going to be kind of sustainable going forwards. It takes a lot of time to put these episodes together. It might look like and feel like we, uh, just hash it all out and, uh, fly by the seat of our pants every time we sit down and record, but there is actually a fair bit of work that goes into this in the background, especially by, um, by Rob, if I'm being brutally honest with you. <laughs> Um, but if you'd like even more content from us, you can grab it over on the Patreon. So um, we have three tiers. Our legionary tier comes in at three pounds a month. And for that, you receive uh, our Tactica shows where we go into kind of depth on Tacticas and sort of specific units. We do two of those every month. Um, also, all of the uh, event uh, materials that we produce for all of our events, so be it kind of event packs, all of the cards, special missions, et cetera, et cetera, are also available for you to download and utilize. Our latest event, which is my event, uh, went live last week um, and sold out within a day. So yeah. fucking thank you so much to everyone that's come in. Um, we've managed to up the capacity this time around to 32 players. So hopefully that'll be the kind of format going forwards as well. So we'll be able to offer a little bit more room because we've sold out every event we've put on so far pretty quickly. Um, if you would like to put your name down for the reserve list, then just drop me a DM on Instagram or email the show. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing a lot of you up at Yately in uh, end of September. Our Centurion level tier is uh, just a fiver a month, so you get all of the benefits of being a legionary. Um, you also get access as well to the Heresy Hammer Lodge over on Facebook, which is a kind of pretty active community for all of our patrons to kind of share um, <clears throat> what kind of whips and what they're working on, talk about kind of lists and sort of tactical analysis of certain units, how games have been going, what events they're going to, etc. cetera. Um, our Centurion... Um, level also gives you um access early access to event tickets although the legionary it's here not. does do that as well so i'm not quite sure why maybe we maybe need to update it as well yeah. we do need to think to update it so you get early access to event tickets but we do a tri-annual or a trimesterly uh giveaway to win a legion console painted by one of the team so the first time round was a death guard praetor that i painted we drew the second one last week yeah rob yeah. And what did the uh, what did the or the gentleman the the winner pick for that? What are you? It's going to be uh, a librarian, an Alpha Legion librarian. 
So, oh, fantastic. Based on Tyler's Rubio, if I'm correct. Based on Tyler's Rubio, yeah. Wow. So, uh, pretty exciting. So, yeah, uh, I think it'd be pretty cool. I mean, there's it actually, like, when you look at it, I mean, the, I, I saw lots of bashing of the new librarian console, and I did, when I spoke to Igor about it, I was like, oh, how about the new the new console? Because I think the Alpha Legion one looks like that in cut in those colours. Yeah, it would look really cool. Um, but actually, the Tyler's Rubio model is actually fairly neutral enough. You know, it's in a Mark VI. It's got some cool, like, filigree that works for any kind of, like, Loyalist Legion. You just need to uh, buff out or kind of fill in the... Um, the 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 sigilite iconography and you're away really because and it, it makes a really good uh legion kind of librarian console i think um bit of a head swap if you want to uh eagle wants to keep it um but you know you could just drill out that head i don't think you even need to drill it out because i think it comes like separate you can just take off the, the head from the psychic hood and then put whatever head you want to so yeah works well I think it's going to be fantastic. And normally, Rob, as a as a commission painter, what sort of money would you charge for a uh, kind of bespoke character yeah. console? So job? Uh, probably for like a Death Guard Praetor, the one that you did, probably around about between anywhere between 120, 160. Um, I think because this one has a little bit of conversion work, somewhere around the 200 mark, maybe a little bit more. Um, Fucking yeah. unreal. Uh, Rob is obviously worth every penny, but you can also get that for potentially just five, well, not five pounds. You have to subscribe for four months to be eligible. So we've just drawn the last one. So if you subscribe uh, by the end of May, we're going to be drawing the next one in September. So you need to be subscribed for the next four months at the five pound tier. And you could be in with a chance of winning a character conversion or character kind of console. And be painted by one of us. We're all pretty good painters, I think. Um, so uh, you can check out our work if you go over to the Instagrams. And then lastly, our Praetor tier, our just second most popular tier um, is, uh, so you obviously get all of the benefits of the previous uh, tiers. Um, you get a shout out at the end of every episode, which is why you see us go through and do our role of honor. As you know, that's growing week by week. Um, but we also give you uh, every six months you're subscribed, you'll get a swag bag. So um, we, we're sending those out on a monthly basis at the moment. We sent like nearly 50 out now. Um, the last or well, the first round um, that people receive was kind of like we did some kind of custom dice and we supplied loads of the cards for people to play Maelstrom with. There were some stickers and some event like objective markers. Yeah. However, our next round of Praetor goodies is particularly special because we have commissioned our good friend uh, Wilf, who is Diverging Realm on um, Patreon and on instagram to design us a custom siege breaker console so we had a vote between all the patrons as to what they would like and the siege breaker and power armor was the uh voted the uh the kind of the the winningest choice so wilf's cu currently doing up a custom siege breaker um you'll receive a physical copy the stls won't be available for general release so we will own the file and we will be sending out a physical printed copy it'll be printed by one of our sponsors and um yeah to be well to get your hands on one of those you'll uh, just need to subscribe to the the praetor tier for six months and this, uh, is, a, you'll be this, is, a, this is a sneak peek isn't it this is this, this is, is a sneak peek yeah, yes this is, this is very early days uh for siege breaker so already the head has has changed i think we've kind of come up with the idea that it will have a, a grill like the um the old mark ii uh, tank, tank commander, commander. Yeah. um but yeah. there are other options as well so you can see you can work out from the pics. He's got a got a sword. He's a siege breaker, kind of surveying the landscape. But um, uh, the um, we are going to have different weapon options for him as well. So you can pick and choose which which weapon. Oh, yeah. We from. are very very excited by this. So like I said, you won't be able to get your hands on the physical on the file. We will we will have kind of the the file itself, and we'll print you out a copy. Um, and uh, yeah, we are really excited. It's uh, been good fun working with Wilf. He's a really, really super talented sculptor. I think, you know, in terms of independent sort of sculptors, especially for, for Horus Heresy, the work he's been doing for kind of his, um, it's like a generic Space Marines, Ultramarines, and sort of sisters specifically have been just unbelievably well received and are incredibly popular. So um, if you want to check out his work, all of his kind of generic stuff or say generic stuff, general stuff is available on his Patreon. So if you search for Diverging Realm on Patreon or on Instagram, go and give him some love and um, yeah, give us some love too. So I think he's enough. a little for commission too, right? 
he is available for commission too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I will. Super yeah. talented. Yeah. Yeah. True, a true hero. We've been we've been friends of uh, for a long time now, and he is. Yeah, like I said, where he's kind of where he's at now. Yeah. Yeah. Just out of this world, some of the stuff he's producing. Yeah, so. so good. Okay, right. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. The first thing, obviously, we need to do is we need to really introduce our guest, Kieran. So um, many of you will be familiar with his work. I would say I've been following Kieran's work since, genuinely since I got back into the Heresy and the Warhammer Hobby, back on the Bolter and Chainsaw forums in yeah, the, yeah. I was 2000. 14 or 2015 i would say when i kind of when i kind of got into the heresy yeah. but kieran why don't you kind of take us through the take us through the timeline um well i've been in the hobby for a long time probably started in around 2000 or 2001 i started off with warhammer fantasy and then slowly progressed into 40k and then when um the uh, the Black Library book started coming out for the Heresy in 2008, I think it was. I started getting right into that. I was already interested in the Heresy um, through reading about it in White Dwarfs in the um, Index of Studies articles for the different chapters. They always had a bit of um, fluff about the different Primarchs and you know how they were found in their home worlds and what their legions were like before the Heresy. And there was always a color plate in there with the, the pre-Heresy legion colors. So I was already into it via that. And then when they started producing the novels, it was um, so, so good. And then I got into the, um, the, the collectible card game art that was in the Collected Visions book. Yeah, yeah. That's where it kind of, it really, really took off. Like some that of that was stuff a, that was incredible. A, that was yeah. a really understated, incredible collection of artwork pieces, those, yeah. those card games, yeah. Still love flicking through that book. So many good pictures. Like, obviously, a lot of it was done before the kind of armor marks were, yeah. I suppose, more properly codified by... Forge World with, um, you know, the black books. So there's a lot of kind of artistic license in there. There's a lot of crazy John Blanche stuff and that kind of thing. But some of the artwork in there still, like, holds up so well. And even the stuff that's a little bit funky is still really great for inspiration. Like the Custodies and the Sisters stuff in there, that's still the best Custodies and Sisters stuff that they've had, you know, they've ever produced, essentially. Like, Could not so, so good. Yeah, really, really good. So, yeah, got into, into Heresy through that and I started converting... Um, up some models. This was before Games Workshop was producing any or oh, Forge World producing any of the resin kind of early marks. So I was just converting stuff out of mostly Chaos Space Marine kits, but also I was using bits from uh, Grey Knight kits. I did some Thousand Suns using bits from the Tomb King kits, which were of course available back then, really good. Um, and did a couple of Emperor's Children things, but they were kind of, I used a few kind of Blood Angel-y bits because, you know, they've got the wing icon, they've got yeah. the the filigree, the fancy-looking armor, some sanguinary guard bits. But, um, yeah, that's, you know, it was always just a little, like a bit of a side passion, and um, I was still kind of focusing mostly on my 40K army. And then, so it was, I think it was 2010 I joined the Bolter and Chainsaw, so that was even before, um, before the Black Books came out. So I just had, like, my small little, one was, wasn't it, my small little blog on there, yeah, um, just my um, uh, Empress children, but mostly Thousand Sun conversions. And then it really took off when the Black Books came out. It was absolutely crazy. It, like, blew my mind. I was so lucky that um, I was a big fan of the Empress children ever since I read about their background in the Index of Stardis article. I think it was in, like, 2003 or four in A White yep. Dwarf. So I was really hot for the, the, pre, the pre-Heresy Third Legion. And I was just, yeah, really fortunate that they started with this farm three. So I got models straight away. Got fluff straight away. Got the you know the color plates straight away. That um, is interesting, yeah, Kieran. As well, amazing. Is that, yeah, because they got they they going preparing this. I kind of forgotten how many so early models they've got, but just in general, how many models that the 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 range of Empress Children is really extensive, isn't it? Um, and yeah. um, because they got so much love in those uh, so much love in those early days, but loads of them still hold up. So like the cacophony, yeah, really. like are. Uh, it, you know, they were sort of like that weird one where they are, you know, that they were an early produced model, but they are basically just quite chaosy, aren't they? You know, and um, yeah, they've got a great range of models. Even now, it's held up over however many years that it's been out. Yeah. So yeah. I, I also used to have a 40k Empress Children Army very back in third edition. 
So, uh, and Empress Children was also my first love when I uh, started playing Heresy. I painted up quite a substantial army and then kind of got my way through the books. And I think I finished Fulgrim and thought, no, nah, mate, I've had enough of you. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's something I think I'll, I'll always end up, uh, I'll always go back to at some point, certainly. So what is it about the kind of Empress Children that kind of really, really sort of spoke to you then? Um, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, I was fairly young when I was reading about it. No other kind of, especially the pre-heresy kind of Third Legion, which is what really appealed to me. There were, you know, perfectionists. There were soldiers that kind of, um, you know, used strategy, used tactics. They were kind of a finesse legion. They weren't, uh, you know, a brute force legion like the, the World Eaters or the Death Guard. They relied on, you know, skill and um, generalship to kind of win their fights. And I think that's what kind of really appealed to me. I liked, always liked kind of elite forces that I could focus on, you know, because painting, as well as the fluff, painting is my biggest kind of joy in the hobby, more so than playing games. I still love playing games all the time, but painting is where I get my my most joy from. So I always love those kind of heroic kind of um, forces. Because, you know, they're always in, usually in brighter colours, a bit yeah. more detail, you know, easier easier to work with and to make look really nice on the tabletop and um yeah it was just fell in love with their background their fluff um and you know they were always kind of my favorite legion in the background but you know i had hadn't seen any pre-heresy art for them apart from what was in that article and i think that was like one black and white foot picture and then the single color plate of the uh the mark six um emperor's child in you know the pretty bright magenta they used to be in but um yeah, then obviously, you know, just went to the next level with the black books. They, they've got quite an interesting, I think, black backstory. Um, yeah, I think you know, and we, and we, so. we, we've touched on this very briefly with um, uh, when we looked at our kind of like our trade allegiance, but the whole idea that basically they were they were fucked because of a gene seed um, kind of error. And then, you know, when when we went through it, Lee was sort of saying about the fact that they were um you know, they work so closely like with militia forces or solar auxiliar forces, but, you know, they were often also kind of seconded with the Sons of Horus to kind of learn from them because they were so small and then built themselves yeah. up from there. You know, real comeback underdog story. And then, you know, to, to the, to the, um, to, to this perfection. How did they get, because they are also the only legion that can have the emperor's, um, Aqu Aquila, aren't they? What do you do? You know the yeah. story about that? Is that did they save the emperor or something? I can't quite remember. They did. It was in. Um, it was called the the Proximum Betrayal. Uh, betrayal. So, the um, emperor's children and well, the emperor early, early, early Great Crusade had conquered a world. Um, they were marching through the capital city for a victory parade, and then the um, rebel forces from the defeated um, uh, system attack the emperor with a huge vortex weapon. Right. And it was only thanks to the um, emperor's children millennial that was with him sacrificing themselves that he was able to be extracted by the custodies. So they saved his life essentially at the start of the uh, great crusade. So that's, that's why they get the Palatine Aquila. And then it's, and then it's become the ultimate heresy because it remains uh, like a, 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 an iconography throughout the heresy yeah, period, doesn't exactly, it? Of, yeah. That Aquila, you know, it's it's really interesting that they don't they don't get rid of it, but it maintain like is a prominent, you know, the ultimate irony or the ultimate heresy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they like to remind, you know, they like to twist the knife a bit for the loyalists, but they yeah, also like to yeah. remind the other trade legions that they are the, you know, they're the chosen legion as they see themselves, yeah. even though they were never a premier legion so you know so to speak because they never had the numbers yeah they were the legion that came the closest to being destroyed of all the legions mm. that made it to um to the end of the heresy so you know they had 200 members at one stage why why which is, you know right much less than any other legion that's all they yeah. had because I mean, like, you, could, you could white. paint that let's be yeah, honest it's, like, it's not unreasonable yeah. to think that you yeah. could have the entire empress children legion painted yeah um yeah. i'm right in thinking that you you sort of uh, your army is sort of more slanted to ones towards the kind of loyalists, correct? Is that the sort of the kind of yeah? My my um my current army is um just one hundred percent loyalists. Yeah, I haven't painted any traders for it. I've painted trader models for fun, like I've done my um Eidolon conversion, my Lucius conversion. I've done some Palatine blades. And they're a lot of fun, and I do enjoy them. But it just takes so much work to do those traders. Whereas you know loyalists are essentially just Space Marines out of the box. There's nothing too <laughs> fancy about them. No. 
but they are it is a tortuga box as well because this marine on the right hand on the left hand side sorry is a, a different marine to perhaps what most people are, are used to so these ones on the right are Valentine yeah. Blaze, but this this guy's a bit of a chonky motherfucker, isn't he? It? And and uh, but these are <laughs> available. You can get these, right? Yeah, so that's one of the um, space Romans. I think they're called in Tortuga Bay. They're supposed they're supposed to be, you know, like an ultramarine kind of equivalent. But I um I thought they fitted quite well for the Emperor's children. I just yeah, um, changed a few of the details and then gave them the green stuff, pressed um Palatine Aquila, Aquila on the chest, and it was pretty much good to go. And then used, you know, um. Uh, what have I used on there? Some the Palatine blade head and then plastic Mark IV shoulder plates and just basic bits, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. I think we've got some more work as well. Oh. We yeah. sure have. Yeah. What on earth possessed so, you to do a uh, a world eater? <laughs> well, I've always loved the world eaters. I was when the first black book came out, I was actually gonna start with world eaters because I've always found that when I'm collecting an army, I struggle when I'm collecting my favorite army. Because yeah. I, I just the way like I am, I want it to be absolutely perfect. I want it to be, you know, exactly the way I imagine it in my head. Whereas I find that if I collect, you know, maybe my second or third favorite army, I'm actually much happier with it in the end because I get the work done. Yeah. I get the game, you know, get the models done, I can play games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not too fussed about it. So I was actually gonna start with World Eaters. I, I bought some uh some uh, resin mark two and I bought the transfer sheet ready to start them. And then I don't know why. I think maybe I painted up one Palatine blade as a test model, and um, that was it. Yeah, <laughs> it was all over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've painted a few World Eaters over the years, but um, never done a proper army. Yeah, just love yeah, their colour scheme. So good. You've got quite. You've got quite a collection of like single miniatures, I think, or just like small. Yeah. Models, I guess you can make a cool heresy kill team. I reckon with the ones that you've. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Got. Ultimate shattered legions. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I love all of the legions and their color schemes and backgrounds. So I always have fun just doing uh, one-off models if I want to try out a new paint or yeah. try out a new technique. Like you know, when I was first learning how to weather, mm. that's when I started painting you know different models. And when I first got the airbrush, I painted more models from different legions. And then when I started using chipping medium, used more models from different legions. So I just yeah. you know, I love to um, experiment a bit and um, just try out different schemes. Yeah. Was the Alpha Legion your first uh, heresy, proper heresy army, or has it always been the Emperor's Children? Or is it was it... the Emperor's Children. So I had right. my, my um, in first edition, I had my Emperor's Children army. I think I got it to about four and a half thousand points painted. And then I went, uh, switched to the Alpha Legion. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> both armies look fantastic. Both are, both are, yeah, excellent. And then you've got some kind of like traitory conversions. These must have taken ages, right? Like the Eidolon conversion yeah. that you've used here must have, because you, because you're also quite a, a very competent green green stuffer sculptor, aren't you? But this is is it all a sculpted head that you've done with Eidolon here? Pretty much. So the base the base of it was a crypt ghoul from like the uh, the old vampire counts range. Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So the nose, the nose, and the um, mouth are the kind of base kind of model. Yeah. But then I um sculpted like um uh, all the fat around the neck. Yeah. Um, I actually redid the nose a little bit, and I changed the eyes. I you know added the the gill slits on the side of the head and the cabling and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, awesome. That's well, great. Then, the same with the um uh, Lucius conversion. Like I, yeah. that's just a my classic Mark IV head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyone yeah. who's seen my work will have seen that head a million times. Yeah, and then I, I love that one. With a knife yeah. And added some hair on and. Yeah, I think most of those models have had quite a bit of green stuff work on them. Like the um, the head that you can see on the Palatine blade, kind of center center top of the yeah. image. That's like that's a lot of green stuff as well. So yeah, just a lot of fun. Like I really love that aesthetic, and I really love those. Um, I love to do some trader Empress children, as we'll talk about later. They've got fantastic mm -hmm. rules compared to yeah. the loyalists. Yeah, but it just yes. like. If I was to get them to the level that I would want them to be, it would just take me forever. So yeah, I can see that. Take too long. Yeah, I've been yeah. waiting like fifteen years for Games Workshop to bring out a new um, noise marine kit for forty k that I can use for thirty k. So yeah, if, yeah, it'll be coming someday. Sure. You need yeah. to uh, adopt a fuck it that'll do mentality here, and that's what you need to uh, condition yourself. <laughs> in. Yeah, yeah. Or get Doesn't Wolf too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get Wolf. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, Kieran, 
the reason we've got you on is to talk about the third legion the empress children so i think uh when we were discussing previously i um found had a kind of a huge early affinity with the empress children but it all came down to how fulgrim was portrayed in the novels that i found him completely kind of reproachable and didn't get on with him at all but i think that's actually really like a really kind of strong character like a really strong trait because he was clearly written in a way that made him sort of so divisive and i think that really speaks to how well the uh the majority of the black library heresy novels are are written um so I think we've already talked about how they've got a really interesting kind of backstory, but they've also got some really kind of cool rules as well. Um, so we want to kind of discuss kind of, you know, how you can potentially look at kind of theming an army, how you can look at sort of setting an army up and also how it's going to, how it's going to play on the tabletop as well. And kind of what you can kind of look to look to sort of do with it. Um, because it is, I think one of those, one of the armies that is, you do sort of see a mixed bag between it's not necessarily always a traitor. You do see kind of quite a lot of loyalist Empress children at, at various yeah. events. Yeah. I, I must say as well, Kieran, that, um, uh, that I was, so number one is you don't see a whole raft in the UK of Empress children armies. Um, but I was, I had always assumed before looking at the, the rules and preparing this, that they were kind of just basically close, close combat monsters, but the, quite a lot of their rules, wall or traits, things like that are based around leadership as well. You know, they've got, they can d do some interesting things with leadership, um, which, you know, you liken them to kind of the old, uh, word bearers rules, I guess. Um, but as well as having that kind of close combat finesse to them i don't know if that's a, a, a fair statement from your perspective i think it is yeah like with the emperor's children rules in general they've always been seen as just that assault army because i don't know if it's a hangover from um like third and fourth edition like 40k where you know mark of slanesh gave you plus one initiative right and it's just carried over into 30k like personally i don't know if it really kind of encapsulates what the legion is the legion is like it's an all-rounder legion that does everything well, that doesn't have, like, a particular niche. Like, they do have a preference for, like, fast manoeuvres and, like, precision strike combat, but they're a legion that is, you know, as happy to shoot you as they are to, like, go into close combat, but that's never kind of really been represented in the rules. Like, it's slightly represented in the rules now, as we'll get into, but um, previously, I've personally, I've always felt that, you know, strangely enough, I think the ultramarine rules from Horus Heresy 1 were a much better fit for the Emperor's Children than the actual Emperor's Children rules. You know, they yeah. focused on, you know, combined unit tactics, which is exactly what the Emperor's Children do. And, yeah. you know, there was, a bone, there was a penalty if you lost your leadership. And the uh, Emperor's Children are like a highly kind of rigid formation that relies heavily on their commanders. And, you know, it's a bit of a cult of personality. Yeah. So yeah, that's that kind of aspect's never really been expressed but i think with the new yeah. warlord traits it's kind of a bit more like that so yeah. yeah yeah that is interesting actually because you've got um because the tactics in the black books that they use are often outflanking um sort yeah. of overlaying or overlapping um uh kind of maneuvers um where that you know sort of it's uses heavy support squads to, to the most efficient kind of way that you can yeah. in the spn3 but because you've got yeah. characters like Fulgrim, Eidolon, and Lucius taking such centre stage, and they are all um, uh, essentially swordsmen. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, exactly, that, yeah. I, that I feel that that basically has permeated the rules of of of, of, of Horus Heresy. But yeah, I can see what you mean about the interlocking tactics. Whether that would have been a better better one for the Empress Children. Yeah, very interesting. I, th I remember as well when we uh, when we did the episode where we wrote up the thousand point allied detachments. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the Empress Children was the one that I revised the most times because uh, not because I was getting things wrong as I have been in the last kind of week, but more so that um, more so that I just kind of kept thinking, oh, this should be cool. Oh, but I could do this. I could do this. And in the end, it ended up being an assault squad and some Palatine Blades and a land yeah, raider, which yeah, it was always going to be. Thing. But um, there we yeah. go. Right. So without further ado, uh, would somebody like to read me Flawless Execution, please? Yeah, I will. Um, so, on a turn in which they make a successful charge, even if that charge is considered a disorder charge, models with the legions of Star Special Rule make their attacks in Assault Phase at one initiative step higher than normal. After any initiative step modifiers from other Special Rules have been taken into account. Uh, if it's a vehicle, 
Uh, it gets plus one to all hit rolls made for defensive weapons when making a shooting attack as part of a reaction. So the, I mean, that's nuts, isn't it? So basically they've got initiative two thunder hammers, initiative two um, power fists, which is, you know, just even your basic Terminator squad, it just makes them so much better. But oh, I think where unreal. it really comes into its own is the stuff that's got, like going at initiative now, you know, the Centurions and Bratals are now going at Initiative 6, right? Um, and so those Power Gun Blades, those Phoenix Power Spears, those weapons that are Initiative when you consider, um, you know, the special characters, people like Lucius or whatever, and Fulgrim as well, because he, he will get this. Uh, just the ability to go first is pretty pretty nuts. I don't know if for you, Kieran, whether it's come up much, but I'm thinking, you know, like a an all Volkite predator might be a useful one with a plus one to defensive weapons, but um, yeah, uh, a Punisher maybe, you know, hitting oh, on twos. There you go. Um, all Volkite. Yeah, Punisher. there are some some obvious choices for that. Are uh, return fire at um, yeah. plus one to hit, like the um, like even a saber with the Volkite Saker and a whole mounted mounted culverin. Yeah, that's a lot of shots, especially if it's a squadron or you know your predator with um the macro saker and the culverin yeah. sponsor. So it's like I, eighteen it, shots at strength yeah. six. You know, it definitely feels like you. It's not a rule that yeah you know you would want to build your army around that first rule right the plus one to initiative. Yes. You you don't yeah. want to build your army around the plus one to defensive weapons. You know, if you had a, a unit no. that could do it and benefit from it, that would be great. But you definitely yeah. want to build your army around this. Um, uh, this this rule yeah it m might influence which vehicles you take but you wouldn't want to have like you know maybe more than one squadron of that because obviously you're only unless you've got a wall of trade that lets you react twice in the shooting phase you're only going to be able to do it with one unit anyway so might yep. as well just you know focus on one unit that can do it well and then just yeah. um focus your other points on the um plus one well on, on initiative higher so you know like we said yeah predator's good Saber's good, and of course the punish is just insane. You know, if it, if you give a Volkite sponsons, it's like twenty eight strength six shots. Oh yeah, okay. twos, <laughs> that's, you that's, know, insane. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah, it's really good. There's wow. some obvious. There's some obvious ones, but yeah, yeah. I, I I haven't got any of those in my list at the moment. But um, but that's where I would look. I like. I don't really feel like a Punisher kind of suits the Emperor's children. It's a bit too you know indiscriminate. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Kind of, it's not their fancy kind of you know. Precision weapon, but there's no denying yeah. that it would be amazing on a return fire hitting no, on two. No conversion beamer and heavy bolt or dreadnought. That's uh, <laughs> pretty well, <isn't> <laughs> um, so we've we've discussed right. This is one of the better. This is really actually one of the low key best. Um, yeah, Legionis and Starties. You right? Special yeah, rules. Yeah. Okay. It's cool. It's good. What it relies on it relies on the charge though. Yeah, yeah, but you know, like ABC may always be charging, as we know. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you know, Iron Hands or Imperial Fists or Iron Warriors yeah. that just get it, you know, nearly all the time. It's it's something that happens, you know, a few times a game. Well, that's I why you need to flawlessly um, execute your maneuvers, don't you? And then you'll get yeah, it. Yeah, that's literally what I was about yeah. to say, which it encourages is that, good generalship. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely. Guess, it's a finesse legion, yeah, for sure. I guess you might be hunting for a, a second movement reaction as well, right? Because you you almost you want to get out of range of your opponent's charges, uh, so to help you to be able to charge and having a second movement reaction probably would be able to 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 support that and help with that. So, yep. yeah, wonderful. Right, so we've decided this is excellent. Let's decide what we think about the advanced reaction. Oh god. <laughs> okay, right. Well, go on, Kieran. What do you think about the advanced reaction? Tell us what it is first off, and then tell us your thoughts. Um, shall I read it out? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. All right. So the perfect counter. This advanced reaction may be made once per battle during the opposing player's assault phase when an enemy unit declares a charge targeting a friendly unit under the reactive player's control and composed entirely of models with the Legionis Astartes Emperor's Children special rule. When a charge distance roll is made for the enemy unit making the charge, the reactive player may uh, must also make a charge distance roll for the reacting unit. If the result of the reacting unit's charge distance roll is equal to or greater than that of the enemy unit, then the reactive player may choose to make a charge with the reacting unit immediately, cancelling the enemy unit's charge if it is successful and gaining all the usual benefits of a successful charge. Or if the reacting unit player's charge distance roll is lower than the enemy unit, the reactive player may choose to have the unit make a shooting attack targeting the enemy unit 
which must also be resolved before the enemy unit resolves its own charge. Right. Okay. Unit, so yeah, yeah. I'm just going to point you there. So basically, you you know, to sum up, basically, you have a roll off on two d six. Whoever gets the higher gets to charge at them. But no matter what happens, if the Empress children fuck it up, they essentially get a shooting. So it. Yeah. it like but they get a shooting before the charge is made, unlike an Overwatch reaction. No, uh, I think that with the Overwatch, you you would still need to um, roll the charge after, right? Because you might be able to kill some guys to make to make the yeah, correct, yeah, bit off some moves. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's interesting one. I don't know how I feel. I think for me, I'd be interested to get your thoughts, but I really don't know how I feel about this being on two d six because it feels that. Um, it's so random that yes. it might have been a good on 1d6 and then the Empress children get plus one. So it's an initiative, initiative check, basically, but they get plus one to or it. 3d6, pick the two highest. Yeah, yeah, something like that, because it just feels really, you know, you've got as much chance of rolling a double one as you have a, 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 a 12, I guess. But um, is it useful if you if you use this before, Kieran? I'll be honest, lads. I've used it successfully once, so <laughs> right. yeah, you have to, you know, you have to beat their roll. And the way that I read it is that the you know the roll that you make for your charge distance still has to be a successful charge. Some people interpret it differently uh... when they say that, like you know, if you're making like a twelve inch charge, the enemy rolls like a double one, and then you roll like a one and a two. You beat yeah. them, so then your charge is automatically successful, even though you rolled a, a charge range of three. So the way yeah. why I read it is that the charge roll still has to be successful. It just allows you to charge instead of them. Yeah. So I so think that it will come down. Depends to how you read it. Yeah. I think it comes down yeah. to what exactly the wording "charge" means in the rules. And basically, I'm sure when you look at it, it's like you have to, in order to declare a charge, you have to be like within range, but also you have to get to it as well. So I think it will come down to the to the wording of the charge. It'd be interesting to see if they fact that though, because like if you didn't yeah. have to make the charge, just beat the roll. I mean that would be pretty cool, right? You know that that would that that would be pretty that would awesome. make it much better, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And um, it is a charge roll, so the way I read that is that when you're making a charge roll, you add you know bonuses to charge distance and negatives oh, yeah. as well. So you yeah. know an assault squad with its jump packs, well actually you can't oh, react yeah. with jump packs, but if you you know if you react with a dreadnought, like you get plus one to the roll kind of thing as well. So Interesting. there's a whole bunch of factors that go into it, but um. Yeah, it's confusing. Like, I don't know if that's the correct way. That's the way that it seems to me. Mm. Um, I know other people who play it differently. Who play it? You know, you do all you have to do is beat their role, and then you get to make the charge no matter the distance. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Cool. But it's Radio. not. It's definitely not like an OP one. It's not like you no. know charging in the movement phase or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, it's not. No. It's not. It's not Space Wars or Imperial Fist. Right? Or Imperial Fist. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. So when we look at the Warlord traits. Um, one thing we we not obviously notice is the fact that they uh, one of the the legions that has sort of traitor and lawless specific, which is kind of quite nice. So yeah. um, the first one is uh, the broken mirror. So this is a traitor only warlord trait. Uh, when a friendly unit comprised of more than one model and within twelve inches of a warlord with this trait, including the warlord and any unit he it has joined, fails a morale check. Instead of falling back, it must instead suffer one wound that cannot be negated by any armor saves or damage mitigation rolls. Oh, but, but you can use a invulnerable save. There. Yep. Ah, interesting. Once this wound has been resolved, the unit's considered to have passed the morale check and play continues as normal. In addition, any armies whose warlord has this trait may make an additional reaction during the opposing player's shooting phase, as long as the warlord has not been removed as a casualty. So pretty good. Like suffer a wound and stay where you are, not terrible, right? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Like, depends how many morale checks you're going to fail, I suppose. You know, that's the most the morale checks that you're going to be mostly making are just the 25% casualties in the shooting phase. And then, yeah. um, you know, if you lose combat, so you know, it's almost like in combat, that's really handy. Like, if you're just yeah. going to lose a combat and then just take a single wound, like mm -hmm. to hang around, it's yeah. massive. It's like it's, it's not pseudo fearless, but it's like. It's in that kind of area as well. Yeah, really, you're going to really have a herald, aren't you? That's the problem. Yeah, well, it depends. Yeah, it depends. You know, it depends what kind of, I suppose, that's going to be on the wall. Or, but if, you know, there's another unit in the same combat or, you know, within 12, they also get the benefit. So it's not just the warlord in his unit. So it can affect yeah. other people in like a combat involving multiple Blacks units. Is, Blacks Sandy. is too good. 
Yeah. And our um, Pantine, Pantine Blades, so they're two wounds and the... Um, yep. Yeah, so yeah, okay. I, could, I can see how this could work well if you've got uh, a warlord with like a squad of Palatines, a squad of the Empress Children Terminators, because you're just like, okay, well, I'll take the wing, but I'm not going to lose a guy here. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fine. Absolutely. Uh, and Rob, I think it's, I read... it's a really oh, nice kind of fluffy rule as well because essentially like it's like a decimation isn't it like the emperor's children like they've failed and they're like punishing one of their squad yeah, members for, yeah, you know, yeah. perceived weakness you know oh you yeah. let us down <laughs> flagellizing the, themselves yeah, to, exactly. uh, to stay in a fight yeah, yeah. okay Cool. Yeah. Like uh, Rob, do you want to read Paragon of Excellence for us? Please? Yeah so the, I mean that essentially I mean it's, it's, a, it's a it was linked to morale right so I think that's why I was like Ooh, it's interesting this is linked to morale and leadership so uh, when mm, any yeah. friendly unit within 12 inches of a warlord with this trait including the warlord and any unit it has joined passes a morale check it gains plus one weapon skill oh so you got plus one weapon skill plus one initiative all pretty tasty until the end of the controlling player's next turn this benefit can only buy once per game turn to a single unit in addition, an army. So do I just choose when to take that, Kieran? Do I, am I just like, right, I'm going to go for my plus one weapon skill now, and then I roll it? Or do I have to, um, uh, like, fail? A, like, Surely have... you have to be in a position where you have to take a morale exactly, test. Exactly. I've got, to, or, I've got to be in a position. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you have to you have to pass Otherwise a morale just, check. Yeah. So it's – and it's. I think it's important to point out that it's – um. <laughs> Uh, can it be applied once per game to, turn to any single unit? And to me, that reads that it can only be applied once per turn to a unit, but it could be applied to more than one unit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. I would I'd read that as... That, so if that, you have yeah. multiple units within that 12-inch bubble, they yeah. can get it. But, you know, you could be forced to, like, um, pass multiple morale tests in a single phase. Like, for example, if someone tries to ram your unit, you yeah. have to take a morale test... And then if you suffer 25% casualties, it's another morale test. And then if you lose combat, it's another morale test, but you're not going to get plus three weapon skill. It's yeah. only going to be ever one. Yeah. yeah. Maximum. Yeah, that's I'm how not, I can read it. Yeah, I think Broken Mirror is better because I think that this one is situational and then you you need to be able to be like, okay, well, um, not only do I need to pass a morale check now, but I need to be in a position to be able to leverage this plus one weapon skill, right? So it's quite, I think yeah. it's quite a situational wall of trade, whereas Broken Mirror just feels like it's situational, but there are more situations that can happen on in five turns than, than uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. that's reasonable. Right, should people, we have a look I at think, the, Oh, sorry. I think, sorry, I think people like to use it um, in conjunction with hold the line. So you pass your morale yeah. test, oh. you get it. To hold the line. That is obviously you're not fantastic. getting, you know, you're not striking at plus one initiative if you're not charging. However, like for as we'll see later, the Palatine Blades and the Phoenix Guard are actually pretty like solid defensive units rather than like damage output units. Okay. So if yeah. you get that plus one weapon skill and then you combine it with something like Sonic Shriekers, yeah, um, yeah, it can be devastating to okay. like oh, just yeah. down actually, the attack. Actually, hearing hold that being ever hold the line, I think actually does change. Yeah, change what I think of that. Right. Actually, yeah. You can read, Kieran, if you're all right, um, the uh, the loyalist warlord traits, please. Absolutely. Uh, a warlord with this trait and all models in a unit the warlord has joined that have the Legion of Angels Stardust Emperor's Children special rule gain a bonus of plus one to hit to all uh, hit rolls made while locked in close com in, com in combat Sorry, with an enemy unit that has any version of the Legion of Angels X special rule and the traitor allegiance. In addition, an army whose warlord has this trait uh, may make an additional reaction during the opposing player's assault phase, as long as the warlord has not been removed as a casualty. That's fucking ape shit. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, plus, plus one to hit. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Obviously, this is the one I use most of the time when I'm not obviously. using. I mean, obviously, assault targets. <laughs> yeah. As a loyalist, um, it only affects you know the warlord and his unit, unlike yeah. um, the not previous one, which can affect. More than one. However, it's on all the time. It's not only on if you pass a morale test, which is makes it far more reliable. Plus one to hit probably isn't quite as good as plus one weapon skill because it doesn't affect what the enemy right. needs to hit you yeah. on. Yeah. But it's still super handy. Yeah. It's interesting. Does um does Sultavitz come with this um does he come with this warlord trait built? No, in? he doesn't. Yeah, he, doesn't. Oh. he specifically mentions him in the in the fluff for it, but he doesn't. He has his own one, which I think is even better. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, you could basically see how this would be mega useful on some like souped up 
Delegatus or Grace yeah. or Right, just having that plus one to hit with a with a bodyguard, a command squad or whatever, would just be it would just really useful when going against your elite units. But as you say, it's not as good on the, on the, as as weapon skill six. Um, but I think that that's a theme of the Empress Children rules, which is it, it just doesn't give you a flat out plus one to weapon yeah. skill unless it's that particular wall or trait, right? So um, yeah, because I think if if it was just a straight weapon skill bonus, then it would become a well, actually, you can't. You wouldn't be able to combine it with Sonic Trickers in this instance anyway, because of yeah. um, it being tra- uh, loyalist only. But even with um, skill unmatched and stuff, there's the Empress Children can do so many things that yeah. involve like to hit rolls or weapon skill that it would become a bit oppressive if they could do absolutely everything. I think. Yeah, so it's not, the, you know, like it's not Solar Marshall. Like the Imperial yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Like, basically, yeah, it's just not a plus one flat. Yeah, okay. more, <laughs> more, more refined, more um, than the uh, yeah, the, the, as it the, should be. Yeah. Cool. Right, okay. Awesome. Yeah. So what you'll also see is that the uh the rights of war will be very familiar to those who've played the first edition of this game as well. So they've kind of been ported over changed a little bit, but yeah, largely ported over from the first edition. So the first one is uh the Maruscara. So um the idea is that I, I really I'll be honest with you, I kind of want to read the fluff behind this because I think the the fluff is really, really sells the whole thing. So absolutely. Um, I love the fluff in all of these little, yeah. little rules. The, em- yeah. the Empress Children took great pride in both its excellence on any battlefield and its ability to systemize and replicate any tactic or strategic deployment it needed and execute them flawlessly on command. Of the innumerable such formations and tactics the Empress Children operated, one that found favor with the Legion's Praetors looking to achieve faultless victory. And thereby glory in the eyes of their peers and Primarch was the Maruscara or Killing Cut. Named after one of the most difficult strikes in the law of the pan European dueling cults, it called for a precisely timed, rapid moving feint designed to engage an opponent's guard so that a second, invariably fatal blow could be dealt against it, in which there could be no defense from. So basically, you're sucking people in in order to them to release their guard, and then you're going to fuck them up. The classic one, two. So. Yeah. Up to four units selected to leech troops or fast attack choices in a detachment with this right of war, and that do not include any models with the heavy, slow, or bombard unit subtype may be granted the outflank special rule at the start of the battle before any models are deployed. All of the controlling players' units made up entirely of models with the Legionnaires of Starters Emperor's Children's special rule that are part of a detachment using this right of war deployed in the battlefield at the start of the battle may add plus one to their movement characteristic until the start of any turn on which the controlling player chooses to bring on any of their own units into play from reserves, including those deployed as part of Deep Strike, Assault, Flanking Assault, or Subterranean Assault. Not too shabby. There are some limitations. So, well, the controlling player does not make any reserves roles for any units assigned to a Flanking Assault or Subterranean Assault. Instead, the controlling player may choose to have all units assigned to a Flanking Assault or Subterranean Assault deploy onto the battlefield at the start of any of their turns after the first without making a reserve role. Fucking wonderful. Um, detachments using this right of war may not include models with a movement characteristic of zero or any models with a slow or bombard unit subtype. I mean, they're all rubbish anyway, because no one takes them, so it doesn't really matter about it. <laughs> fucking t- Someone who's used bombards, they are fucking garbage. <laughs> Apart from the grav one, which we've discussed previously. Uh, no more than half of the total number of units, sorry, total number of units in a detachment using this right of war may be assigned to a flanking assault, subterranean assault, or otherwise held in reserve. And detachments using this right of war must take a Legion Centurion, Cataphracti Centurion, Legion Tartarus Centurion with the Legion Champion or Phoenix Warden console upgrade as an HQ choice. Uh, so to a lowly um, Imperial Fist pleb like myself, it just seems the most obvious one that I've seen uh, and most common one I've seen is basically a Talon of Dreadnoughts coming in from outflank because you don't need to roll for it. They've got quite good movement. They can assault from the outflank because it's, it's put into an, an outflank assault, right? Um, and then you you can choose where they... Because you, you put the marker down and choose where they come from, right? Um, and so you can have two contempts of basically in your enemy's backfield fucking shit up. Is that the most obvious build that you've seen, Kieran? Is that what, what, what do you tend to, to, to bring on from reserve in that situation? That's what I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is so the most obvious... obvious. Yeah. yeah, and it's 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 better than it was last edition for sure. Just with the changes to um, outflank, yeah, make a massive difference. Um, I think you're, you're allowed four units now, whereas before you were only allowed three, and you've also yeah. got access to uh, troops now as well, which before it was only elite and fast attack. So it's much better than first edition, and first yeah. edition it wasn't too bad at, at all. And um, 
this is the ride of water that I pretty much always use. Yeah. Um, obviously, I can't use the other one as a loyalist, and yeah. um, none of the generic ones kind of appeal to me. It is like it's another one of those kind of finesse kind of things. Like you got to get your outflank right. So you know, it does yeah. kind of play into the emperor's children a bit. You know, kind of do everything the hard way just to make themselves look good. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, and like you said, dreadnoughts are the one to go. Yeah, um, I also because they're, because they're survivable, I, right? They're not going to be shot off the board exactly, straight away. Yeah, exactly. And like a talon, you will get a, intercepted. Yeah, yeah, because a talon just means that basically you can intercept what like one of them, right? One is going to go. So taking two or three mm -hmm. is probably probably good idea. Can I just um, clarify as well for our listeners? So the other thing that strikes me about this one is, you know, the obvious one is the use of assault squads here. So you, yep. um, so you've you're adding plus one to your movement characteristics. So does that then make assault squads move 12? Well, uh, sorry, 13. Yeah. So that means then, if, I forget three. this right, so they get plus three to their charge, charge. charges as well. So they move yep. 13, and then they've got an 11-inch charge technically to make, but that 11-inch charge becomes an eight. So move 13, charge an eight, you run to your opponent and... Um, and oh. then you, you've got first turn um, assaults, haven't you? There, which is pretty yeah. nuts, right? If you can get everything off at the same time, that's 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 awesome. Yeah, apart from the fact that like assault squads aren't going to do anything unless they. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, apart from the fact, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the, but where, yeah, no, where, it's... where we will probably work is um, uh, Palatine blades, right? With with assault uh -huh. assault packs would be really useful. Palatine blade, Aquila, yeah. yeah, and now another change, yeah. That plus one movement is really good, and it is only until the turn that you bring on your reserves. Right. But in the last edition, it was only for the first turn. So now it's you know you can have it on for multiple turns, which is fantastic. Yeah, that is I good, isn't it? Yeah. People talking it, about leaving something really cheap in reserve and just having that plus one rule yeah, you know, yeah. for most of the game. Yeah. 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 So but, um, does it say um, just to, to clarify? So it says until the start of the turn on which the so if you bring your no, don't worry about it. It's fine. I think I've already figured it out in my own head. I was going to say, does it include the turn that they come on? But obviously it wouldn't. No. Because it's the start because of the Because you bring them on before the movement. Yeah. 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 And I think the final... But, um, oh, sorry. Go on, Kerry. Go on. I was just going to say, one other thing to notice is, like, obviously, usually you're going to bring them in turn two. That's usually the best thing to yeah. do. Yeah. But um, in the previous edition, you had to write down on a piece of paper which turn they were coming in. Right. Now yeah. you can just decide. So yeah. if, if it's not set up and it's not looking good, or if you want to put a few more wounds on that heavy support squad or snipe out there um, or grease scanner before you bring on your reserves, you can leave it to turn three or four if you want to. So, yeah. you know, you can make that tactical choice of when to bring in the units. That's brilliant. Really yeah. Handy. It's really cool. And That's can, a really you know, cool you even, yeah. yeah, you could even leave troops, you know, in reserve till late game, like, Assault mm -hmm. squads, for example, who can run on 16 inches, you know, in the last couple of turns to claim an object objective, for example. Yeah. So there's different things you can do with it, yeah. That's cool. And then the other, the final thing I would say is that you have to take a champion or a Phoenix Warden console. Now, we probably will debate this further when we get to the Warden console because I, I'm really glad that they've left that choice open because my, my yeah. feeling is that the plus, the weapon skill six is just better than the, the rules that the Phoenix Warden console give. But I'm really glad that they've given that choice to the Mariscar because um uh yeah great right at war i don't think it's overpowered but i think it's cool it's finished it cool. um it's pretty themey yeah yeah it's, yeah, really it's cool. nice whereas the next one is a bit more like savage it. and brutal um i mean it's still yeah. themey but it's, still it's definitely um, themey yeah so basically this is your classic uh noise marine army right yeah. so the effects are cacophony squads may be taken as troops choices in a detachment using this right for not too shabby although i think when we talk about the cacophony they're probably not quite as good as they maybe were in the previous edition where they where they could be a bit mental oh, okay cool i'm happy to happy to be proven wrong i mean they come with fearless just their standard cacophony yeah um yeah. they're more reliable now but their potential yeah. damage is lower but i think they're yeah. more reliable. that's fair enough yeah. any yeah. unit uh <laughs> I do remember culling swathes of Mechanicum with Cacophony in the first place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, any unit composed entirely of models with both the Legionnaires of Start as Empress Children Special Rule and the infantry unit type that is part of a detachment using this right of war may select a single surgical augment at 30 points per unit. We'll come to the surgical augments in a minute. Um, and all models unit must be given the same surgical augment. The limitations are it's traitor only. 
and uh, any models with the character unit subtype in the detachment using this rifle wall must have a surgical augment, either as bought of an upgrade to the unit using the rules of this rifle wall, or bought separately using the rules presented in the armory of the Empress Children. It, this seems like an expensive upgrade. I know a surgical augments are good, but... 30 the, points is a lot of points. 30 points for, like, a unit is... is it's gonna, You need to basically set, set aside 10% of your 3,000 points to be able to upgrade lots of people to uh, with it um yep. i guess but i suppose any it it's just that it can be rather than it must be right you don't have to upgrade them with the uh, social elements but oh you do ha you do have to in this yeah you have to oh. upgrade them oh. every character must have it yeah oh right okay mm, okay so, so it can get, get pricey the thing is that like in a regular list that's not third company all of your sergeants can take them anyway Right, uh, okay. So this one just gives you a bit of extra security by giving it to the whole unit so that, you know, if, if your sergeant gets sniped out or if you're tanking wounds on him, for example, then you still have the, um, so have you it. know, the okay. surgical augment, augments. But some units don't really want surgical augments. Like my jet bikes, for example, I wouldn't really bother putting a surgical augment on them. They right. don't want to be anywhere near combat, for example. And, right. um, you know, they can take an augury scanner so they don't need to be able to see further at night and yeah so it, it's great for some units less good for other units like it's i don't know it kind of washes out i think okay cool so what are the surgical augments yeah so do you want to take us through them kieran absolutely uh any model with the trader allegiance and both the legion legionis astartes special rule and the character subtype but not the unique subtype may select a surgical a single surgical augment from the list below at a cost of 20 points. First one is Sonic Shriekers. Uh, during a turn in which a unit with at least one model equipped with Sonic Shriekers successfully charges or is themselves successfully charged, all models in any, in any enemy units uh, locked in combat with them suffer a minus one penalty to all to hit rolls. Models which are immune I to the see. effects of fear That's X right. special rule are not affected by this modifier. That's cool, cool. Like, just talking about that, that's fucking brilliant. Like, yeah. yeah it's so good. Yeah. Really powerful. Um, this is probably the best piece of war gear in the list for the Empress Children, for sure. That, a minus one to hit is just... Ah, fuck, that's just... Yeah, okay. Like, because exactly. then, you know, if you're, you're elite units that weapon skill five going against weapon skill four units, they're hitting you on sixes now, right? So yeah. it's yeah. just... Fuck. Ah, and even fuck. even if even if you're going against other weapon skill five units, if we're talking about Palatine Blades or Phoenix Guard, they've got their skill unmatched. Yeah. So they can make their weapon skill one higher um for when the enemy rolls to hit them. So you can still make elite units roll sixes to hit you. Ooh, oh mama. Yeah. That is pretty uh pretty nutty. That's great. Okay. Obviously, um, I think Fearless gets around it, and um, I think Fear uh, Stubborn might get around it. I'm not sure on the wording on that, but it could. So yeah. there are a few units in the game that get around it. So basically, um, you need to and... like you you need recon squads. If you're a opponent, you need recon squads to fucking snipe out these sergeants to be able to um, uh, to be able to kind of fight them. But if your whole unit yeah. has Sonic Shriekers, you basically just like Great company, that's, yeah, that's exactly. Okay. Or even you know a couple of characters in there like. A, you know, it's, it's expensive, but an apothecary could take it as well as like an extra backup. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, it's really, really good. I think with a successful charge, um, I think if the enemy held the, held the, held the line, you wouldn't get it. Yeah. 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 Because um, it becomes disordered and then disordered, you lose special rules associated with charging. So, yeah. you okay. can counter it by holding the line or being fearless or being yeah. stubborn, I think. But otherwise, it's just fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Cool. Really, really awesome. good. Um, the next one, Subsonic Shriekers. Uh, sorry, Subsonic Pulsar. A model equipped with this upgrade and any unit it joins ignores the penalty to leadership and ballistic skill imposed by the night fighting special rules. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Why it's your Sun Killer Sergeant, yes? Yes. Yeah, if you want it's going to put it on a unit, it'd definitely be the Sun Killers for sure because um, they can take an augury scanner, so they'll be ignoring the, um, the range limitation of night yep. fight. And so once you ignore the range, the leadership and the ballistic skill penalty, you're essentially got night fight. So 
Yeah. The other thing, so like if I was a Raven Guard player, I would want to use like improvisers or or buy Night Vision, but I think I'm at risk of being blinded um, quite easily with with those. Whereas this doesn't have a risk associated with with it. It's just a, yeah, that's that is also great. But again, you want to put it on, as John says, you want to put it on specific units, right? Yeah, needs to be combined with an augury scanner as well to get around the the range limitation. So this with an augury scanner essentially gives you night fight. Got it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Except, except you won't be ignoring like uh, uh, shrouded, which Nightfire yeah. gives you as well. So okay. the yeah, enemy okay. will still get their shrouded roll, but you yeah. get around all the uh, the limitations of Nightfire. Yeah. Got it. Cool. cool. So, handy. You don't see it as often because obviously a lot of people play combat units with yeah, sort of yeah, but still yeah. really handy. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And the third one is the Sonic Lance, uh, a model equipped with this upgrade. Gains the Sonic Lance weapon. So it is a template. It is strength two. It has no AP. It is assault one. It's breaching six and it's pinning. Uh, it just it just seems like it just doesn't compare to Sonic Shriekers uh, at no. all, really. So you'd never put this on, on your sergeant, but if you were playing third company and you could get it on a whole unit, potentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Carry on. Sorry. I think I think it's the weaker of the three surgical um, augments, but um, yeah, if you wanted to do it, you definitely go in third company elite and try and put it on a whole unit, and just try and roll some sixes with that strength too. Fishing for sixes, you've got 20, 20 attacks. Fishing for sixes. Yeah, it's a lot of yeah, templates. Decent, Although to be fair, decent, laying down decent over, templates Overwatch, with, yeah. with twenty guys is a bit mental. Yeah, right against Overwatch. Fucking Overwatch. Yeah, you won't be doing it Overwatch. Yeah. Christ. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Rightio. So we then also got their own range of uh, very iconic Phoenix power weapons. So these are fucking cool. They've always been cool. Um, yeah. Should, we, uh, not... should we just take a quick break before we uh, carry on with this? Yeah, we sure. can do. That's good. Cool. Right, let's take a break. Enjoy an advert. Cool. So we're going to talk about the iconic weaponry now of the Empress Children, the Phoenix pattern power weapons. So there are. So I think again, when we talked about earlier, like when we kind of think about the kind of the the fluff, there's um they're they're kind of largely duelists. A lot of the Empress Children, so they like to fight with a bladed weapon. So they are given a Phoenix rapier, which is strength as user AP three, which is uh rending six plus and murderous strike six plus. Not too shabby, right? And then yeah, you've also it's... got Yep. Sorry, it's, yeah, it's 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 great. It's it's a um I don't know, it's relying on sixes doesn't excite me at all. Oh but having come on. having said that. Having said that, like, you know, it's the same, it costs the same points as a power sword and it just gets murderous strike on top. So it's, you exactly. know, you can't yeah. really complain about yeah. that. Like, exactly. But it's right. just this not is... like, it's just not a massively devastating weapon. It's just a great kind of, you should never rely on, on a power weapon. Kieran, you should gamble yeah. on sixes. Then you have a much better time <laughs> in life if you gamble on sixes as opposed to trying to rely on sixes. That's um, it. That's it. And then we've also got the Phoenix Power Spears. This is strength uh, plus two. So obviously, if you can combine it with a rad grenade somehow, as we've discussed in the, in yeah. the last kind of previous Tactica, um, yeah. AP3, um, it has reach one, which is really nice. I don't see a lot of reach, but reach is, uh, reach is good. Um, but it is also murder strike and breaching six plus as well. This one is two-handed, so you can't combine it with another weapon or with like a, um, a shield, etc. cetera. But um, whatever, doesn't matter. It's iconic as fuck. Yeah, I really like the spears. Um, mostly just the like the aesthetic of them. They look yeah. absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, the 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 rapier was a new weapon introduced for this edition, so I've still kind of got my love for the spears from the previous edition. I think mm. they were more reliable last edition. The potential for the like damage they can do now is much greater, but their damage was more reliable in the previous edition when okay. it was just a straight um, AP two on the charge. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, they're great. You know, again, you lose out on that extra attack, but you 
going to be wounding Space Marines on twos, and yeah. you're going to be striking at um, plus one initiative all the time. You'll be, you know, initiative six on the charge. So, what's not love to what's not to love with it? Yeah, There's nothing great. not to love. They are top, 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 top tier. Cool. They're also one of the few um, legions that gets a uh, legion specific console choice as well. This is the Phoenix Warden. So this is a Centurion with a thirty point upgrade. So the Phoenix Warden gains the skill unmatched and living icon special rules. Why don't you read this skill unmatched, Kieran? I'll do the living icons aspect. Absolutely. Um, can I just say, I absolutely love the, the name of this special rule mm -hmm. as an Emperor's Children fan. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's exemplars of this and, like, you know, paragons of that and skill unmatched. Um, so, skill unmatched. When a combat that involves one or more models with this special rule is resolved, before the start of initiative step 10, the controlling player of any model in that combat with this special rule may select one of the three following options and apply the effect of that option to all models with this special rule for the duration of that assault phase. When a unit contains more than one model with this special rule, then all models in the unit must select the same option if one is chosen. First option is the perfect guard. If a model or models with this uh, with skill unmatched special rule select this option, they must increase their weapon skill by plus one for the purposes of determining the score required for enemy models to make to hit rolls only, but must reduce their attack characteristic by minus one. Um, perfect strike is the second one. If a model or models with this skill unmatched special rule select this option, they must increase their weapon skill by plus one for the purposes of determining the score required for that models to hit rolls targeting enemy models only, but must reduce their attacks by one. And the perfect fury, if a model or models with this skill and match special rules select this option, they must increase their attacks by one, but must reduce their weapon skill by minus one. So, you know, there's a an attacking one, there are two attacking ones and one defensive one. I think personally the defensive one is the most powerful one. You lose that extra attack, but mm -hmm. uh, the enemy is, you know, hitting you at essentially minus one. Yeah, it's adding one it's to your weapon skill. It's interesting because I think this is where the dilemma of the Centurion and the and the, the Phoenix Warden comes in, which is that it's is it just better to have a flat six up weapon skill, um, hmm. or to kind of choose be it is, between them? It is worth mentioning as well that you don't have to pick a skill on match roll. You can just go at normal weapon skill attack. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so yeah. You it's often better not to. It's like you're being to. railroaded yeah. into it. Yeah. It's off. I when I use it on my um, Palatine blades, I often don't use that rule. Right. I, you know, just prefer to have the extra attack rather than you know get a bonus to my weapon skill or. Um, but situationally, but right, especially a perfect exactly. combine with things yeah. like Sonic Shriekers can be a real yeah. mega. Like if yeah. you've got if you're being if you've got a Death Star coming at you, you can kind mm -hmm. of you can really do a number on them, holding the yeah. line, and then perfect guard right. With yeah. combined with Sonic Shriekers, you're yeah. just you're just not going to be hit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're going to take a massive punishment, if you know if you've got power fists or thunder hammers coming into you, then then the uh, perfect guard is definitely the way to go, just to reduce the damage. You're going to reduce the damage that you can put out, but the damage that you were going to receive was going to be much greater. So, especially Absolutely. on those units that have skill unmatched, they don't do well against. Um, they don't do well at dam uh, putting out damage against tough like other units like terminators for example because yep. they're relying on that six with their yeah. weapons because they can't they can't take power fists they can't take thunder hammers so they're relying on those sixes their best bet is to slow down the enemy and survive while you know a character with a thunder hammer in that unit just goes absolutely ham interesting sure. okay yeah, so, interesting. also you gains and, the living also oh, mate yeah yeah, so I was just going to say, with the, you know, it's a bit more interesting with the Phoenix Warden because obviously he can join any squad and have it, but only he will have that special rule. Right. So I suppose you know you'd want to have him in a challenge, maybe, and you know maybe kind of just trying to slow down a, a powerful enemy character. Although you know all he, all that has to happen is for one you know power fist or thunder hammer wound to go through, and it's all over anyway. But mm -hmm. yeah, he can just try and slow things down a bit. Well, is it all going to be over? Because well, he does have living, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, living icon. So, a model with a special rule, and all models in any friendly unit with the Allegiant is styled Empress Children special rule, and at least one model within six inches of a model with this special rule gains plus one to the score used to calculate the winner of a combat during the assault phase. Fucking really nice, right? Plus one combat res bubble, 
within six inches. Yeah. Uh, the effects of this rule do not stack, and uh, any given unit can only be affected by a single instance of the special rule. However, uh, and the effects of the special rule do not stack with the effects of Fulgrim, Scythe, Emperor's Children, special rule. But still, that's fair enough. And also, he gains a Phoenix power weapon of any kind and an Iron Halo for no additional points cost. Yeah. So, like, so oh, he gets an Iron Halo. Oh, interesting. Yeah, exactly. He gets yeah, really Halo. good. So oh. he's a Tartarus with a four up. Yeah. Oh, uh, interesting. Mm. Yeah. So even more defensive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that I think that makes it tougher. I think when choosing the champion and the I think they're probably balanced, right? I think you could probably yeah. get yeah. equal uses out of both of them. Um, yeah. Having yeah. having that iron halo is is uh, is brilliant. I think he's cool. I think he's really nice. I I, I could see myself if I was doing like a at the Empress Children Allied Detachment having a, a Phoenix Warden in Tartarus Terminator arm would be a nice a nice way to lead it. I think. I think it'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think so as well. It doesn't break the bank in terms of points, right? As well. So. Oh, not at all. No, so uh, we just, they've just mentioned Fulgrim, Sire of the Empress Children, so we should probably go through old Fulgi mm. and what he does. Um, Kieran, obviously, yeah, experience utilising the Phoenician or uh, or not so much. Not this edition. I, I used him a bit in previous in the previous edition, but not in this edition so far. Um, We've not. We generally don't know what the, army. Don't know what the Australian kind of meta and scene is like as well, but there aren't an awful lot of Primarchs kicking around. Even even at no. instances where we have seen um, like events where that have allowed Primarchs, it's only really Nighthaunter and Ferris Manus that I remember having seen a great deal. <laughs> the four Ferrises yeah, no. that we went to at one event, for instance. <laughs> we um we generally, for some reason, don't allow them. Or mm. even if they are allowed, people choose not to take them. So yeah, I've been I've been to a number of events that have had them at the at events, but um, and I've used them at events, but generally we don't. Yeah, yeah, and no, people seem to have um kind of not soured necessarily on Primarchs, but just less less interested in Primarchs. I think this time around, which is which is I think kind of an interesting take. I don't necessarily think it's a case of people have because I I generally think Primarchs are probably slightly less powerful than they were in the previous edition. I think on balance, I think more interesting though. Yeah. I do think the more genuinely think the more interesting. Yeah. They're you yeah. know, they're they're normally a bit more expensive points wise. Which maybe yeah. is maybe is it. Perhaps people are um, valuing them. Yeah, I think the changes to challenges, um mm -hmm. yeah. and the fact that those attacks are then locked in uh to the challenge then has discouraged, I think, um, perhaps the, the play with Primarchs because you're like, well, I want my Primarch to fucking beat the shit out of this person, but I also want them to beat the shit out of everybody else as well. So I uh, I also that. think as well, people have maybe thought from a self-regulatory perspective, the only way more, you know, I only really want to play a Primarch if my opponent's playing a Primarch. And I know yeah. there aren't really a lot of Primarchs at the event, so I'm not going to bother yeah. taking a Primarch. Yeah. No yeah. one basically wants to rock up to like a 30 person event and being the only one that's taking a Primarch yeah. because people are just like, mm, fucking hell, I've seen that guy with first menace over there. <laughs> I think, I think, um, maybe reactions play us a little bit of a role in it as well now. Like yeah. it's, it's the potential to, for a unit to take damage in the shooting phase or shooting damage is so much higher now. Overwatch, you know, at a charging Primark is so much more devastating now. There's just, yeah, for a unit that wants to be in combat, there's a lot of things that can uh, stop that happening. Like even a movement reaction to get away from a charging Primark, yeah, you know, so enough. I think there's a, a few more counters to it. Cool. Right, let's quickly run through his rules then. So he's movement eight, yep. uh, he's weapon skill eight, so he's one of the higher weapon Big skill boy. Yeah, boys, yeah. which he should be. He yep. is one of the ultimate swords people. Uh, uh -huh. BS6, strength six, toughness six, six wounds, initiative eight, so that's a big fucking, a big one there. That's and, huge. And yeah, six man. attacks on his profile as well. Yeah. So um, he's got some iconic, I iconic war gear. So he's got the Gilded Panoply, the Blade of the Lair, Firebrand, and the Frag Grenades. Iconic <laughs> Frag Grenades. Um, and then the special rules. So he's bulky six, which is... Yeah. It was odd, considering a lot of the others Bonkers. are bulky four. And yeah. he's like and a he wiry, was like one of the smaller ones. Yeah. Guy. <laughs> even, even Vulcan, I think, is bulky four and not bulky yeah. six. Yeah. yeah okay. Vulcan is the largest Primark. I think there might be one other that's six or near him, but I think he is. I think Perturabo is, is six. Right. I think, yeah, but then yeah. again, he should be, as should Ferris, yeah. because they've both got like machinator rays and big fucking other yeah. shit. Oh. That's clearly an error, isn't it? It's been left. Yeah, it's got to be. Well, I assume but, so, like, but, you know, who knows? 
It's <laughs> mental. That's bonkers. Anyway, he's got um, Master of the Legion, obviously, Bulky Six, Sudden Strike One. He's got Crusader, Tactical Excellence, Sublime Swordsman. He's a traitor and he has the sire of the Emperor's children. So, um, options for Grimma Exchange the Blade of the Lair for Fireblade at no additional points cost. But let's be honest, give him the Blade of the Lair. Lair. Yeah. So, Sire of the Emperor's Children. Um, so we just talked about how it doesn't stack with the living icons rule from the Phoenix Wardens, but what does it do of its own? Uh, so oh, this, one, this one does stack. Oh, it does, does it? I thought it said it Yeah, multiple stack. living icons don't stack, but this stacks with living icon. Ooh. Yeah. Should have been reading harder, shouldn't I? And I'm not sure if a Vexilla would stack as well or not, but yeah. Yeah. Why not? Doesn't say it doesn't. Any friendly models with the Legion is a start is in children's special rule that can draw a line of sight to Fulgrim may use Fulgrim's leadership characteristics for any morale and pinning test they are required to take. And all friendly units composed entirely of models with the Empress Children rule on the battlefield while Fulgrim is also on the battlefield gain plus one to the wound value used to calculate if the unit has won a close combat. In addition, the first reaction made in each game turn by Fulgrim and any unit he has joined does not use up a point of the controlling player's reaction allotment. That's pretty nice. Again, I think this is good. I don't think it's fucking apeshit OP. Um, I think it's just good. I think he's quite a good force multiplier, but he's also kind of quite standalone. I think what we tend to find yeah. when we look at Primarchs is they tend to fall into one or two categories, right? They either tend to be a force multiplier like Perturabo, or they tend to be an absolute fucking apeshit, single-minded dick kicker like Ferris Manus. And it's yeah. unusual that you get a kind of a nice blended combination of the two things. Which I think actually this yeah. is probably more falling into that category from a personal perspective. Yeah, what do you, what do you, suits what do you him. think? A, you know, well, yeah, I think it suits him really well. He's a, a supreme general as well as a swordsman, so that balance is Absolutely. definitely better than just like a pure fighter kind of um, yeah. rules for it's him. Like I his... think like obviously weapon skill. Te- uh, sorry, leadership ten is absolutely fantastic, particularly yeah. like with night fighting. Although he has to be visible for that to happen. So, you know, your Primark's got to be on the tabletop. Exactly right. Early turns to take advantage mm-hmm. of that, which isn't fantastic. So it's going to be, it's going to come into play more kind of later in the game, I suppose. So, War Gear, the Gilded Panoply. So, this is a nice, simple, straightforward one. So, mm-hmm. the Gilded Panoply provides Fulgrim with a two up armor save and a three up and vulnerable save against melee attacks and a four up vulnerable save against all other wounds. So, if you're trying to snipe him out, he's going to get four up and vulnerable. And if you're trying to beat him up in the challenge, he's going to get three up and vulnerable. That's Not great. That's too shabby. Yeah. 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 Um, Kieran, do you want to read us Sublime Swordsman? Mm-hmm. Sure. When Fulgrim makes melee attacks as part of a challenge, he gains a number of additional attacks equal to the amount. Uh, which his initiative characteristic is greater than that of his opponent. For example, if Fulgrim attacks an enemy character, an enemy model with an initiative characteristic of five as part of a challenge, Fulgrim's initiative of eight will grant him three additional attacks. So that's pretty bonkers. And yeah, that's especially nice. like the Emperor's Children plus one initiative doesn't doesn't bonus doesn't give a bonus to that because it's just striking at initiative one yeah. higher than it otherwise would. But his sudden strike on the charge will. Yep. So he gets an extra one on, on the charge. So he's initiative nine on the charge. Mm-hmm. And then I'm pretty sure the Blade of the Lair has Duelist's Edge. So if he's in a challenge, he's initiative 10, striking at initiative 11. So he would be getting bonus attacks against everyone. It just depends who he's fighting. If he's fighting like a Praetor, he's getting an extra five attacks. So does the, um, so does the rule say... Um... I haven't got the rule in front of me just because my screen has gone black. But does the um, is it is it the initiative characteristic? It says Kieran. It does, or, and sudden strike adds your initiative yes. characteristic. Yeah. Uh, okay, right. So it so sudden strike changes the initiative characteristic. Wow, that's this is nuts. Like, yeah. Wow, he's got so many attacks, and like the yeah. stupider and slower you are, the more attacks he's got. He's got against you. It's yeah. not even the more, uh, the more perturabo you are, the more attacks he's got against you. Yeah. <laughs> They're not devastating <laughs> attacks, but he has a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At weapon skill eight too, of course. Which yes, is fantastic. absolutely. Um, so he also has tactical excellence, as he should, because he is tactical and excellent. Um, so once per battle at the start of any phase, Fulgrim's controlling player may declare the use of this special rule for the duration of that phase. Any enemy units that attempt to declare a reaction against a move, uh, reaction against a move, shooting attack, or charge made by Fulgrim or a unit he has joined must first pass leadership test. 
Um, unless the unit, unless the unit that's making this reaction includes a model with the primal unit type, in which case they may declare reaction as normal. So if you want to make a reaction against Fulgrim, you have to pass leadership test. Unless you're a primal. Once per battle. Once yeah. per battle. That's I mean, yeah, bit of a mere rule, like it might come off, but most of the time there. it won't. It exists. Yeah. You're not yeah. taking him for that. You're taking him for fucking 900 attacks at initiative 11. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think when we talk about iconic weapons of, like, we should be mentioned, especially Blade of the Lair, we need to mention in the same breath as, like, as Worldbreaker, as Forgebreaker. They yeah. exist yeah. in this this bubble of being super iconic weapons, right? Yeah. So, how good is Blade of the Lake here? And do you want to do you want to read us? Uh, it's read pretty good. Words? It's much better than it was in the first edition for sure. So, strength is user. So, strength six, mm. AP of two. It's a melee weapon. It has Jewelist Edge one, Flesh Bane, Master Crafted, and Specialist weapon. So, there's no there's no way he can get a bonus attack for two weapons, unfortunately. So, he can't have like a bajillion attacks. It's just a bajillion minus one attacks. Yeah. But um. It's really good. Like, Fleshbane is fantastic, even against yep. a Dreadnought when you have to re-roll to wound. It's, you know, it's twos to wound re-rolling. Like, you're still going to get a shit ton of wounds at yeah. AP2. So you're still going to beat up on a Contemptor. Um, and even more so if, you know, if, if it's, you know, a Fury of the Ancients general Contemptor and he can take it in a challenge with his initiative, like, it yeah. absolutely stomp it um, with his attacks. Uh, Mastercraft, it's fantastic, of course. Um Combined with weapon skill eight, absolutely fantastic. And Jeweler's Sedge is really, really good um, just to get that um, initiative up in a challenge for the, an extra attack, essentially, because he's already going to be going first most of the time. So it's not going to tip him over another Primark per se. But um, yeah, it's good. I think actually against Jagatai, it might give him the edge in a challenge when he's not charging. But anyway, like it's not. The Jewelist Edge isn't going to help you kind of strike first, really. It's more about getting that bonus initiative. Absolutely. Um, so he can, in theory, exchange the Blade of the Lair for Fireblade, which is a bit more of a basic bitch weapon. Or is it? Mm, yeah, it is. Uh, it's strength plus one, so it's your strength seven, still at AP2. It's got Murderous Strike 5 plus, and it's Mastercrafted. Yeah, so um, I would I would probably go for the Fireblade, I think, because I just you? love that, that sweet... Uh, Murder Strike. I think that um, it's a bit risky, but I think that the you know, um, uh, yeah, I I want to because you got so many attacks, right? And yeah, a third of them are going to be oh, but blade of blade of the lair is blade of the lair. Um, and I, I assume uh, uh, all his attacks precision because he's a Primark, or some of them are precision because he's a Primark. Yeah, yeah, all of them. Yeah. Um, so you can be like, yeah, I just. Yeah, I think that that's mega useful. I, yeah, I'd okay. go with Fireblade. Yeah. Okay. And he also um, has Firebrand as well, uh, which is a pistol, which is range 15, strength 6, AP 4, pistol 2, deflagrate, shred, mastercrafted. Yeah. 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 You know, I'll take it in for It's, it's cool, weapon. but you're never going to shoot it. Yeah. No. Uh, fucking rubbish. Comparison <laughs> to everything else. So, yeah, ignore that. <laughs> So again, when we talk about iconic units, so these are the Phoenix Terminators. So these are um, fucking cool, great models, like unreal oh, models. Um, yeah. And I think, to be honest with you, they were really in the previous edition when we talk about kind of 1.0. And it's really weird to be still be talking about that when we're nearly a year into the second edition of Heresy, right? But we still kind of, we had 1.0 for a decade. And um, when we talk about, the Phoenix Terminators, they were just a bit underwhelming in the previous edition, right? They were still one of the just first... a little bit trash, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit trash. They were, they were when the great rebalancing of sort of about twenty eighteen happened. They were still one of the units that somehow got left behind with like one wound and this whole load of other turp. So anyway, yeah, that's interesting. And were Spears uh, AP two on the charge carrier before, and then they were yeah, pretty sure they were plus one strength AP2 AP on the charge, two, yeah. and then right. just like AP3 yeah. on... So basically, yeah. if they got charged, they were fucked, weren't they? Basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And Five even, like, you know, even, you know, going on to second rounds of combat, like, against another elite Terminator unit, they were never going to kill enough. No. And then they're just AP3 next turn. Yeah, interesting. So again, the Phoenix Terminators, again, in the kind of lore, were written as being kind of Fulgrim's sort of bodyguard. 
Um, so again, another kind of iconic unit. So their Tartarus Terminator armor. So again, one of the few kind of um, special Terminator units that are in Tartarus, as opposed to being in Cataphracty, because obviously they need to be fast and rapid. Um, so they've got all your kind of normal um, like veteran stats, I guess, for one of a better term. Weapon skill 5, BS4, strength 4, toughness 4, 2 wounds, initiative 4, 2 attacks base, 2 up saving um, Toyota Terminator armor. So they retain their ability to sweep, they retain their ability to run, and their, their high movement value. Um, they come with a Phoenix Power Spear. Um, I can't see how many points they are based because I've got all of the fucking bars for... I think it's like 35. So they're cheap. They are cheap because they were they're very cheap. Not, they yeah. were not cheap for a little while, weren't they? Um, yeah. And they have a whole raft of special rules. So they are relentless. They're bulky too. They're stubborn, which is great. Great, yeah. Um, especially when the champions lose ship nine. They also gain the skill unmatched and living icons rules that we discussed with the Phoenix Warders, which again makes them super versatile. And they can be taken as a retinue, which is really, really nice. So, yeah. Yeah, really good. And be given a flag. We... Yeah, no, really like good unit now, much better. Um, and their like their secret cheese is that they're uh, characters. They're all characters. Oh, so can... whoa! Okay, yeah. Wow. So wow. that's that's where they can become a bit abusive, you know, with wound sharing and those kind of shenanigans, especially you know, yeah, that's true. mixing Sonic Shriekers mixing skill unmatched and then sharing wounds around, they can be quite a survivable unit, even though they're just in Tartarus. Oh my God. Right. So, um, right. So you can do that with the Sonic Shriekers and, and the, the surgical augments. You can be like, well, this guy's going to have one Sonic Shrieker. This guy's going to have what, like whatever the second one was. And then the whole unit gets it. Is that, is that right? So, so every, every model in the unit has to have the same surgical augment oh okay oh, but I you see. could have characters in there with something else but obviously with this unit you would only go for sonic shriekers so the minus one to hit every time and then you can combine that with um you know plus one weapon skill for when the enemy's rolling to hit you so yeah. a weapon skill five unit is hitting you on sixes okay yeah. and then you're sharing wounds around you know yeah. like it can be quite quite nasty yeah but like the damage for... they put the damage they put out is not good no they're not yeah. traitor only yeah okay interesting they, well, they are from the me, perspective of taking a, a surgical augment. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. So yeah. those stacking rules are the things that really set them apart, right? Yeah. That, that's really going to... Wow. Okay, cool. All right. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, you could imagine that you had a character in there with um, Paragon of Excellence or whatever, and you held the ground, held your ground, held, oh, sorry, held the line, plus one weapon skill. Your weapon skill six now. You know, it's just... Yeah. Yeah. They you just wouldn't even, have, you wouldn't even have to use... The, yeah. uh, the um, perfect defense. You just have your extra attack and they'd still be hitting you on sixes, yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Well, you can also then use, you can use your the attacking characteristic, right? So they'll be hitting you on sixes and you'll yeah. be hitting them on threes. Yep, yeah. getting your attack, getting a bonus attack, yep. That's nice. Yeah, cool. Right, so these are now gone. Grenade harness, yeah, always take it. Yeah, and these guys are top tier now, we think, don't we? Let's be honest. Yeah, with, with uh, that. for survivability, not for damage output. Yeah, okay. They're a good bodyguard. You want a character in there with a thunder hammer, right? Fine, great. Or Fulgrim or something, you know. Yeah, and they can take a Proteus as a dedicated transport, or a Spartan if they're big boys. Yes, yeah, Spartan, larger. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right, Palatine Blades. The one on the the squad on the right basically just enables is the um, revised version, which enables you to take them with jump packs again. Correct, because the book version. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't doesn't have that option. Jump yeah. packs. Yeah. Okay, so Palatine Blades, another iconic unit. Um weapon skill five BS five, which is pretty good. They can fire their bolt pistols extra hard. Um, <laughs> I think the thing that you're looking out for here right, is the fact they all they all come with artificer armor as standards, so they all got yeah. two up save yeah. out the box. They also get a charnable weapon, and, I, and you know my thoughts on charnable. I fucking love charnable weapons. How would you how would yep. you consider running these as sort of like a cheaper unit with charnable weapons, Kieran, with a, a smattering of the kind of Phoenix weapons, or do you think you kind of need to sink loads of points into them to make them good? Well, I'm always looking for point efficiency, so I usually go kind of 50-50. So yep. um, five with sabres, five with spears. I don't know if the spears are kind of the – it's definitely not the most um, – like devastating unit um as far as weapon options are concerned i think the best option for them is just the power axe for five points 
because you're striking an initiative two on the charge. Yeah. yeah, and you're getting that that bonus attack for two two weapons. So you know they've got four attacks each on the charge. Weapon skill five, like it's just absolutely insane. But yeah. you know, from a fluff perspective, an axe on a Palatine blade just seems completely wrong. So you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So I go the kind of fluffy route, and I take five spears and five sabers. Yeah, charnable sabers. That is charnable sabers. Think, yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. think? They need an apothecary if you're sinking that many points into the into the unit because they've got no invulnerable save, right? They've just got the, the yeah. flat two up. So um they absolutely need an apothecary. Um right. for sure. Yeah. Um, especially when you've got a two up save and two wounds, like the value of that apothecary is just so much better than it used to be. Like they used yeah. to you used to have to pay ten points a model for other uh, Sarama and then yeah. they had one wound. Yeah. So like you know, an apothecary is still good in that unit. To yeah. keep your expensive models alive, but it, now when you've it, got two wounds each, yeah. they've got to get through twice as many wounds at yeah. a, like a two plus save with an apothecary. And it, and it will, the, the apothecary will make their points back rate right as well. And you could give them surgical as well if you want, or you know whatever yeah. whatever fancy. Well, we'll quickly we'll quickly yeah. run through the the walking options and the rules. So special rules yeah. wise, the things that really stand out is the fact they get counter attack and chosen warriors. So again, we talk about them being a defensive unit with skill unmatched. Yeah. Yeah. Like counter attack means that they can kind of they can really have their, they can have their cake and eat it right. Yeah, yeah. If you do and try and hold the line for like Paragon of Excellence for that weapon skill, you won't be able to counter attack though. So you got to kind of if you have that Warlord trait, you got to kind of make the choice. Yep. Whether you right. want to take away an attack or get that weapon skill. Yeah. But well, certainly from the perspective of skill unmatched and the perfect guard, they're not necessarily going to be losing the additional. Uh, are they? Yeah, they would actually. What What really strikes me uh, in our discussion about Empress Children, I think, is that you know I always put down Ultramarines as a Legion and Alpha Legion to some extent. That you've really got to think tactically about kind of what, what best rules to use. But it's quite apparent to me that actually the Empress Children is the army where you've got to do the most amount of in-game thinking. Maybe not so much at the list building stage, but at the in the situational combat by combat, movement by movement, reaction by reaction, what exactly decisions you're going to make about which rules to employ at which like certain times. It's definitely like way um, there's, you've got to be really cognizant of what your opponent can do, the understanding of that that particular unit, their weapon skill, um, what their damage output is, then, yeah, you've just got to be way more cognizant than I thought you would necessarily need to be. It's definitely a thinking person's uh, army, the Empress Children list, isn't it? Yeah, I completely agree. So yeah. um, the transport options I find fucking bizarre because none of them are able to... <laughs> To yeah. charge out of them, obviously. So a Palatine yeah. Blade Squad may take a Legion Rhino, a Legion Drop Pod, or a Termite Assault Drill as a dedicated oh my God, how bizarre. No, no. Joke, where's the, yeah. where's the Land Raider? The other night, and I was like, where's my carrier? Yeah. Yeah. Where's my fucking Land Raider? Um, yeah. uh, so the uh, Palatine Blade Squad may take up to five additional Warriors at 28 points. Any model in the unit may exchange their Charnable weapon for a Power Weapon at five points. Phoenix Power Spear at five points or a Phoenix Rapier at five points. I think they're all pretty good options, actually, to be yeah. Like yeah. five points is not not crazy. Um traitor unit may have a surgical augment for 25 points. And obviously, like a lot of this stuff, like when it's 25 points for a unit, it obviously scales better than more. Yeah, absolutely. More guys you have in the unit. Yeah. Um, you can take a uh, plasma pistol on the prefector for 10 points, which is hitting a burst. I wouldn't fucking bother personally. Um, and the melter bombs are 15 points. So, um, obviously, you used to see them quite heavily, I think, in the previous edition with jump packs, which they're omitted from in the original Lever book, but they did get FAC to uh, give them jump packs back. Oh, um, it was a bit of a meltdown uh, when that happened, yeah. Same thing with Reavers as well and the Sons of Horus yeah. list as well. So I'm glad yeah. that this got seen to pretty quickly. Now, given that you have to... So you, to give them an Assault Transport, it's going to use up a uh, one of your heavy support slot options. Are you... You tend to give them jump... Yours have jump packs, don't they? Am I right in thinking? Yes. Um, I'm planning them as a, an Aquilay squad, so with the jump packs. But I also want to use them with my new Praetor model, so <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have a jump pack. So I'm going to... Um, I'll probably magnetize the other uh, packs at some stage, but at the moment they're going to be a jump pack unit. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So we're probably thinking if you're starting again, jump packs a sensible option. Yeah. Unless yeah. you want. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah. And especially like with Mary Scarrow, right? I mean, exactly. Like, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. yeah. It could be really good. And the fact they've got yeah. two wounds now, Chuck and Apothecary in there, because they used to be they used to be single wound models as well, right, in the first edition. Correct? Yeah, with a three-up save, like 10 yeah. points for Artificer Armor. Yeah, yeah, the right. yeah. So, yeah. jump packs, don't put them in a fucking termite. I'll come around and take that termite yeah. away off you if you do that. And, you know, the, the Aqualade dudes, like the additional Marines, are only two points more expensive than the regular ones for the jump pack. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's really good value. And I think, like, a, a squad of 10 is 40 points more, so you're paying four points per jump pack. So I think I think that's really good value. Obviously, they're a bit more exposed and out in the, uh, you know out in the open. But if you want to do your Maru Scara with plus yeah. one inch, you know coming in from the start assault. of the game oh, or man. even coming in from an outflank, yeah, exactly. Pretty dangerous. Naughty. I, like I really like these yeah. guys. Really like these guys. I don't every, think they're every, OP or anything, but they're definitely I know, useful. Yeah, I agree. I think every list I've ever written for Empress Children has got a squad of Palatine Blades in there. I think I just kind of can't. Oh yeah, can't Style get away points, from hundred. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then you've got the Exemplary Battles Sun Killer unit. So again, another iconic unit. Like some of the very original Emperor's Children artwork you'll see is five dudes gathered around with the kind of like Laz Cannon slung over the shoulder, throwing up their gang signs, and they're just <laughs> unreal. So um, obviously what sets them apart from the starting perspective is the fact that they are BS5. Um, <laughs> their war gear is a Laz Cannon. So, like, <laughs> set, setting yeah. the stage here. So we're looking like a hundred is one hundred eighty-five points. Yeah, yeah. So again, sorry, I've um I've got half of my screen obscured by bits and bobs. Um, good. so movement seven, weapon skill four, BS five, strength four, toughness four, one win initiative. Four, 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 four. Uh, I mean, there's no need to cut to split hairs about it. They yeah. are great for points, right? I mean, oh, they're 100%. so good. But they're only there are zero to one choice, so you could you can take one. Yeah. You, well, are you, Look, are you kind I don't of know down if they're great for points. Well, no, I love them. I always take them, but they're 40 points for each additional model. Yeah. So right. they're decent value at a five-man squad, but once you start adding more to it, it's so expensive. But, but also, you know, like you, a, a five-man squad You're looking is at a 400-point of... unit for, for 10 of them. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> a comparative, like, you know, heavy support squad is so much cheaper. You can even have, like, a 10-man heavy support squad with a... um you know, an apothecary and a um a master of signal to essentially have the same ability and like right. it's still cheaper. Right, interesting. Okay. Okay. But yeah. also f- five is not ten man last cannon squads I'm fucking I'm just over ten man last cannon squads to be perfectly honest. Me too, with you. Yeah. I like my I like my five. Yeah f- a five man like heavy sports squad a five man sun killer squad. No one's gonna no one's gonna turn the nose up about them as well. And also as well I think is from another perspective is from they they're not quite such a target at five men. I agree with that. Yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think people are going to start to think. Actually, do you know what? I'm going to get better value out of trying to pop that Kratos yeah. or that Spart or that like Spartan and or Land Raider full of horror than I am these five dudes. So I think that they yeah. don't attract so much fire as a five man unit. And plus, as well, like you can, I know from a from a hobby perspective as well. Like you want to make these guys like super. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? What is ornate. the word I'm looking for? Yeah, ornate. Exactly the word I was looking for. Um, and I think, uh, like, at five men, you can really make them super individual, make them really stand out. But I think once you get to yeah. ten, you're going to be like, oh, fuck these guys. <laughs> if I had my time um, again, I would have used the same models that I used for the the Palatine Blades to make these guys. But I didn't have them at the time, so they're kind of ba- a bit more basic than I would have liked. Sorry, mate. So you can... <laughs> The ape shit thing is the fact you can take up to 15 additional sun killers. So you could have 20. <laughs> yeah, 700 oh, point unit. Oh. Yeah. Oh. When, over- <laughs> when overkill just isn't enough. Um, yeah. So they get special rules, uh, precision fire, designated quarry, and fortified position. Um, these guys can take a land raider. Your Palatine Blades can't, but these guys can. Yeah. But no, ape shit. What the fuck? Not, not if and they, of course, if they take the land raider, they have to start in it because it's a dedicated yeah. transport. Yeah, so you're absolutely. snap firing in the first turn at, at best. So Yeah. So you can, nice. any model in the unit may change the last cannon for one of the following, Volkai Culverin, Plasma Cannon, or Multi Melter for free. So... Just saying. So it's interesting that one. I think around the precision shots. I think that that is uh, it's really interesting. But the the thing is that now that last cannons are so good, they've got the thunder, the strength nine. I think just the most obvious choice is the last cannon, right? 
Yeah. So they've got precision fire, Rob, not precision yeah. shots. They've got their own they've got their own special rules. Oh, so right, right, right. so um the the noviator, noviator, the guy, the sergeant. Novator. Novator. Yeah, let's, let's go with the correct pronunciation. Uh may take one of the following an August Gannon melt bombs or artificer armor. I think for ten points, just naming this tank a, a wound here and there is maybe not a terrible idea. What do you think, Kieran? Just just to like one thing with the weapons, obviously yep. if you upgrade to any of the other weapons, you're essentially overpaying for them because the LAS cannon's the most expensive of Correct. those options. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So yeah. if you like went to like, you know, a culverin, you're paying over like an extra five or ten points or whatever it is. So just keep that in mind. And then with the sergeant's war gear, his augury scanner is twenty points as opposed to the usual ten for most units. Yeah. So just maybe like I suppose for a heavy support unit. Probably they should all cost 20, but his does cost 20. And he's the model with the augury scanner. So if you're going to tank wounds on his artificer armor, you could lose the augury scanner as well. Yeah, so it's the same thing with, keep in mind. with Iron Havocs as well. It's the exact same thing. Okay. We talk yeah. about their, their Iron Sight like it is their, their sergeant yeah. that has the uh, the cool shit. So. Yeah. But also, so once the night time... fight's done and the enemy's reserves have come in, you know, go for it, you know. Yeah. But one other thing important for this unit no um, Vexilla, which is massive yes. for a heavy support squad that's going to be near the edge of the table. Yeah. I lost a game because my last two um, Sun Killers fled off the table. And that was it. So, you know, that's just something else to keep in mind for where you position them or if you want to put a character with them or a Herald or something. So just another thing to keep in mind, yeah. Mental. Right, so precision fire, not precision shots. This is precision fire. So enemy models may not make cover saves or damage mitigation rolls against a wound caused by a shooting attack made by a model with this special rule, unless that shooting attack was made as a snapshot, in which case cover saves and damage mitigation rolls are made as normal. Wait. That, I mean, the fact that they get rid of damage mitigation is, is nuts yep. because basically no vehicle is safe from these guys. Nope. Nope. Yeah, and uh, um, like if you have night fight via a um a um a master of signals, this you know your heavy support squad will be ignoring uh damage mitigation for um shrouded anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice little bonus with the cover saves, which you can't otherwise get. But um, yeah. you know, cover saves aren't what they used to be, so it's not that big a rule. Yeah, yeah. But like, it's still it's still bloody fantastic. But there are other Absolutely. ways to get it for other units. Yeah. 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 So, um, do you want to read us designated quarry, Kizza? Absolutely, bro. At the start of the battle, once both armies have set up all their models, including any unit with the infiltration special rule, a single enemy unit with the gargantuan, super heavy, knight or knight unit subtype may be chosen to uh, by the player that controls any models with this special rule. This enemy unit is enemy unit is considered the designated quarry. When an, when any friendly model with this special rule, uh are uh, used to make a shooting attack against the enemy unit. Their controlling player has selected as a designated quarry. All failed to wound rolls of a one may be re-rolled. If the enemy unit selected as a designated quarry has an armor value, add plus one to any uh, results rolled on the damage uh, vehicle damage uh, chart as a result of these. Wow, yeah. yeah. So really good, really fucking good against super heavies. You know, yeah. you're going to be um, getting an explode result on um, five plus. So yeah. 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 Fantastic. Well, we're moving and into the uh, as we know, we're moving big into... demons. You're going to be really rolling ones and stuff. Yeah, the Typhon meta that we're moving into. Not a super heavy. Yeah. Oh, it's not, is it? I forget. No. Yeah. So there aren't as many super heavies or gargantuan things <sighs> as there used to be in the game. So it's only come up a couple of times for me, but it's really good when it does. Yeah, I think that that's the thing, right? Which is just even with the precision strike rule or whatever it's called. Um, it, they are just a fantastic unit and as you say just a five and this is just like a, a little cherry on top isn't it you know this is <laughs> it, there's no bad thing about having this additional rule it will come in effect sometimes but yeah, yeah. a little five-man squad of these i think is trevio really absolutely good. they've done absolute uh, work for me yeah nearly my best unit every game yeah, they will be they've got fucking ass cannons mate um, <laughs> In games that allow, the, them, yeah. yeah, the games that allow use of fortifications and Empress Children's Sun Killer Squad that has not selected a dedicated transport because why would you? Yeah. May instead select a defense line without occupying a fortification force organization slot, but the cost in points must be counted towards the army total. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and the new Aegis defense line looks brilliant from mm. GW. 
Yeah, so, so if you want to use two fortifications for some reason, then there you go. Otherwise, you can always just take a, a siege line in your fortification slot anyway. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So if you want two, you can go for it. Interesting. Wow. Cool. Here we go. The noise boys, the cacophony. So I think arguably, I think you're right. I think these guys got more reliable, but I think they also got a bit worse. I really liked the feedback rule yeah. that they had in the previous edition. Well, I think it's a shame that we got it anymore. One thing we didn't discuss when we were talking about third company was that these guys don't get lined. So they they have fearless and and they've got lots of shots. Uh, that you still need to take some tax tax squads to or to unlock that unlock that yeah. line. I think that makes score. sense as well. These guys are all, you know, mental, like in <laughs> yeah. chaos yeah. psychopaths. Yeah. They don't give a shit about objectives. They're just there to destroy people. So, you know, as much as I would have loved mm -hmm. line on them, it makes sense that they don't, they don't have it. Pretty yeah, great. they just want to look at things and go, whoop. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so they've got normal um, Space Marine stats other than the fact that they are Leadership 10. I mean, they're fearless, but they have got technically Leadership 10. So um, they come with uh, the Cacophony, which is a weapon, a bolt pistol. Sonic Shriek is out the box, which is great. All of the grenades, um, they are fearless and they are traitor only. So you can take five additional bods for 25 points each. The uh, Orchestrator, who is the sergeant, can be given Artificer Armor for 10 points. You can also give him a power weapon or a power fist. But again, I don't know why you'd bother necessarily. Um, unless I'm about to be proven wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> um, but it's their weapon, obviously, it's what you're kind of paying the points for, really. So, yeah. Kieran, do you want to run us through the cacophony? Absolutely, the cacophony. So, it's a range 36, strength 6, AP 5, assault 3, gets hot, pinning, shell shock 1, and deflagrate. So, lots and lots of rules there. Um, not okay. their massive Every rule. potential output it had before, but now much more kind of, um, you know, they replaced the, um, I can't remember what it was called, something Sonic Overload or something with um with yeah, uh, that was great. unreal yeah. that rule. To be fair, yeah, because yeah. it was instant yeah. death, so good. Before, right? And it was just it like, was instant death. Uh, yeah, ignore armor safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, pinning's uh, really nice. Shell yeah. shock is fantastic with pinning. Yeah, deflagrate's great, and it's an yep. assault weapon, which is fantastic. And it's a thirty-six inch range one, and like long range, like high strength assault weapons are pretty pretty rare, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And do yeah. you, um, you, you're going to roll a lot of gets hot, though, right? Like on these, you know, there are 30 shots yes. for a squad of 10. You, you're going to lose a yeah. guy potentially a turn. Yeah, um, they're only one wound as well. So, uh, yeah, so you're going to lose a guy. And a three up save, yeah. yeah. Um, but I suppose that's why they gave them fearless, which is that they are going to be constantly losing guys. Their, their <laughs> yeah. instruments are going to be blowing, you know, their sonic guitars are going to be blowing up constantly. So, um, they're, they're absolutely not... worth it. Yeah, Which is very, very fluffy, cool. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah a lot of people love to give them an apothecary as well for that reason. Yeah. I can 100% yeah. say that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I. It would be really nice to see that third company, just these guys in the troop slots and no line units, just really embracing the. Mm. Uh, really embracing the, the madness of the whole thing. Yeah. I love Do that. you think that you're ever likely to take these? in a non third company elite army um that for what, me i what, think that, what do they do yeah so What's i think their for job? Me, that they are essentially kind of um uh they're they're kind of the equivalent of like a heavy support combined with uh, a support squad right so they're they're basically volkite slash uh, rotor cannons because of the pinning then the deflagrate and strength six ap5 yeah. um so if you are considering taking a volkite squad in your unit um then i think that this would be a a, a a really nice choice you know the fearless is really good i think it's thematic um uh, you know you lose two more shots over the volkite so i think that probably the volkite yeah. is probably just better on balance but i think that this this it, it feels an elite slot right it's not a heavy heavy slot is that right these guys yeah and elites, oh. yeah. yeah yeah it used to be heavy so, yeah yeah so it, with it is the fact that they're elites just means that they're 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 it opens up your heavy sports squads for those five-man sum killers so um yeah if you're thinking of volkite squad maybe consider these um and fill the elites with and get, get them in the elites uh 
the lit scene out. Yeah, I like yeah. them. Well, nice, like nice fluffy alternative to a like a Volkart Culverin squad. Like, yeah, exactly. you know, if you don't want to be that guy, like you know, if, I think a ten man squad of yeah, no one's going to uh, eye roll you when you fucking set ten of these up. Or that no, Cacophony no. with Artificer Armor is you know two eighty five points, and a ten man Volkart squad with like Artificer Armor, Augury Scanner, and a Vexilla is two fifty five points. So like thirty points cheaper for like a much better unit. But if you don't want to be that guy, then yeah, get yeah. the uh, Cacophony. Yeah, and you know, but, I suppose if the cacophony could take a um an augury scanner, that might make them a bit more competitive. But they they can't take that, so yeah. So don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I like it a lot. Be going to lose a lot. Absolutely, Prepare. fucking lose Prepare six. Yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The characters are fantastic. So good. Uh, these are all good, and this is definitely. Yep. I think that I, I genuinely think that this edition, like they've they've. They've done the special characters really nicely. Like they are, you you look at them and go, like a lot of the characters, they are pretty fucking ape shit. Apart from making uh, elite units, troops, eh, Rob? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, the characters are, are really nice now. Yeah. Okay, so Eidolon. Again, another really well written character. I think from a background perspective, I think he's got an awful lot sort of to his character. Nice way to put like, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he's genuinely really, really nicely written. Um, but he's also an absolute fucking murderer as well. Yeah. Like one of the low key best special characters in the game, I think. When we talk Absolutely. about under, when we talk yeah. about underrated, I think I think Eidolon is is in the conversation. So he is uh, weapon skill six, which is which is obviously good. BS five, strength four, toughness four, uh, three wounds, initiative five, and four attack base. Uh, leadership ten, two up, save. He's got a lot of war gear. So he's got an architect pistol, which is really cool. Architect pistols are good. Glory, Eterna, Sonic Shriekers, Warhawk Jump Pack, Death Scream, Artificer Armor, Iron Halo, Frag, and Crack Grenades. And he also has his own Warlord trait. So he has Master of the Legion, independent character. He's relentless, traitor only, and prideful onslaught as his Warlord trait. So, um, Kieran, do you want to read the prideful onslaught for us? Absolutely. Pride for Onslaught. If Lord Commander Eidolon is the army's warlord, then at the beginning of the battle, once all of the opposing players' models have been deployed, but before the first turn has begun, Lord Commander Eidolon's controlling player must select one enemy HQ or Primarch choice as Lord Commander Eidolon's rival. Lord Commander Eidolon and any unit he has joined gain a bonus of plus one to hit, uh, to hit rolls made against the rival unit and if the rival unit is part of an enemy shooting attack or combat that results in a friendly unit being entirely removed as casualties or falling back, then Lord Commander Eidolon and any unit he has joined also gain a bonus of plus one to all to wound rolls made against the rival unit for the remainder of the battle after the shooting attack or close combat has been fully resolved. In addition, Lord Commander Eidolon and any unit he has joined may, declare, uh, may only declare reactions against the rival unit but the first such reaction each turn is free and does not reduce the player's reaction allotment for that phase. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, really Fucking good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, plus one to hit against his rival unit, which is, you know, where he's going to be going yep. anyway with his massive Thunderhammer. And Absolutely fantastic. He's going to be hitting, you know, rival models on freeze. And, um, you know, they're going to be struggling with his Sonic Shrieker and Weapon Skill 6. And, you know, if he's in a Palatine yeah. Blade Aqualay squad... Their, you know, defensive mode and stuff. So it's, yeah, he's just putting out a lot of damage. The plus one to wound doesn't really help him so much with his Thunder Hammer against most targets, mm -hmm. but it'll help his unit a whole bunch, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the Thunder Hammer is not any <laughs> Thunder Hammer. This is yeah. one of the most fucking ludicrous weapons in the game. I, yeah. I genuinely think, like, I'm struggling to think, apart from like Primark weapons, of anything that is. I wish more... Fulgrim had this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fucking hell. Can you imagine? Jesus yeah. Christ. So, Glory Eterno. Uh, it counts as a power weapon for all rules, but it is a Thunder Hammer. So, it's strength, uh, user times two, AP two, melee, brutal two, unwieldy, thunderous charge, mastercrafted. So, it's a mastercrafted Thunder Hammer. Thunder Hammer that also has a special rule. And that special rule is on any turn in which Lord Commander Eindelon makes a successful charge, the model's attacks ignore the unwieldy special rule. It so, sucks because it, it, it fucking hell. That's crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. Because it's also a plus one to initiative as well yeah. on, top, on the charge. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
And don't forget that there's no specialist weapon there either. Yeah, exactly. So, so he's gaining six, an extra attack. Six attacks, six attacks at weapon skill six at initiative six. And it's master crafted as well. Plus one to hit. That's yeah. master crafted. Yeah. 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 yeah, he's bonkers. If he, if he charges you, you you are fucked. Like you yeah. are just unless absolutely. you're a primer, you're gone. Yeah, yeah. unless you're primer, you're dead. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. And he's got a sonic shrieker as well. Yeah. Oh my god, this guy, this fucking guy. Oh. oh man. That conversion I did for him as well is probably my favorite like conversion converted model I've ever done. I'd yeah. love to get him on the table sometime with, well, then you with should some Trader Emperor's children. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Give in. Um and then he also has uh, Death's Scream, which is a uh, template weapon, which is like the Sonic Shriekers one, but it's a bit different. So it's a template strength two, assault one, rending six up, pinning. Doesn't matter. It's not going to fire. It's going to be fucking just laying into his fucking hand. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. It's just a slightly better version of the um, the um, surgical augment that anyone can take. So are we saying put him in outflank with a unit of Palatine Blades with jump packs? In Mario Sky, Right of War, he can't it, because, because he's an HQ. It's only oh, he's an HQ. He's not elite. A fast attack. Yeah. yeah, I think you can get around that with characters in dedicated transports because the dedicated transport gets it, but he right. can't do it with he the jump pack. Anyway, he's got jump yeah. pack, yeah, and he's he's only limited. You know, he's the jump pack kind of limits him. In the previous edition, it was optional. Now he kind of has to go with a Palatine Blade squad, an Assault squad, or a Command squad, essentially. So you got to take your pick of those three units, really. Command squad, yeah, a, a good good choice for him, I think. I agree. Yep, definitely, oh, you know, they can get an involved save. Yeah. What a dick! Scoring, yeah. honestly, and of Love course, him. you know, thunder hammers. They got like their damage output is much better than palatine blades, but they're yeah, just mass, so they can, less defensive. Yeah, in, yeah, initiative two mass thunder hammers, right? Is yeah, yeah. After his initiative six thunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, right. Took that unit off the fucking board before he gets to you. That's the that's oh, the thing. Yeah. hit. Got- yeah, you've got to fucking kill him because yeah. if yeah. he gets to you, you fucked. Basically, you're yeah, fucked. Yeah. Um, speaking of cool cats, Sultavitz, right? Kieran, he's your boy. Talk us through. Sultavitz. He's my boy. Yeah, I use Sultavitz as my general in most games. Um, I'm trying to move away from him now so that I can use a regular kind of character in right and off. Um, yeah, of course, but he can't be my general, unfortunately. Otherwise, he would be, of course. But uh, <laughs> just for um, like for campaigns and for um events set in a particular time, because obviously, Saul Tarvitz only really fits one battle in the Heresy. So yeah. anything after that is a bit kind of uh out of place. You, you know, you can write your fluff for Sigismund being in any battle you want to be, but um, Saul Tarvitz <laughs> so, is only ever really so salty, thing you want. stay salty. <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, yeah, Salt Harvest is if it's just fun, not just fun three or um you know a pickup game, then he's not there. So Salt he has a basic, <laughs> Salt Harvest, yeah. <laughs> he's got a basic Praetor um, stat line, which is better than he used to have. He was kind of like a hybrid Praetor Centurion in the previous edition. So weapon skill six, three wounds, initiative five, four attacks, leadership ten. Um he's war gear, he's got a bolt pistol, a charnable broadsword, which is a unique weapon that only he has. He's got a mastercrafted nemesis bolter, which is pretty handy. Okay. That was just to represent his um bolt gun that he had that he kind of worked on himself. He's got Arc Sarama, Iron Halo, Frag and Crack Grenades. Um, his special rules, uh, Master of the Legion, independent character, Relentless, which is really handy on that bolter when he's moving around. Mm-hmm. Uh, preferred enemy, Emperor's Children. Um, a yeah. brother betrayed. Uh, he's loyalist, and his warlord trait is defiant unto death. His warlord trait is quite involved. It's probably the most involved warlord trait for the Emperor's Children, for sure. Um, so if uh, an army's warlord has this trait, then check at the start of each of the controlling players' turns to see if any of the following rules are true. Uh, point one, the uh, army has, that includes Sol Tarvitz has uh, accrued fewer victory points than the enemy army. Point two, the army, including Saul Tarvitz, has fewer units on the battlefield than all enemy unit armies combined. Point three, Captain Saul Tarvitz is within six of an objective. Point four, Captain Saul Tarvitz and any unit he has joined is locked in combat with more than one enemy unit or a single enemy unit that outnumbers Captain Saul Tarvitz's unit. So there's a whole bunch of ways to get the special rule. Um, I'll just read what it actually is before I go any further. Um, so essentially he gets, if he fulfills any of those points he gets fearless and he puts out a bubble of 
uh, 12 inches fearless as well. So absolutely incredible. Like, so it wow. saved me in a lot of games. Yeah, so if and you're the underdog, extra, yeah, you yeah, get fearless, basically. An extra shooting reaction as well, which is nice. Yeah. So awesome. the way I usually get this is um, just keeping him near an objective, essentially. Yeah. So, okay. you know, he's, he usually goes with my big blob of 20 um, tactical Marines with an apothecary. That blob is really hard to move when it's fearless, nicely spread out, and then... I'll start my units like the um, uh, the Sun Killers, hopefully within twelve, mm-hmm. makes them fearless, which you know makes up for their their lack of a um a vexilla, covers them a bit. You know, towards the end of the game or mid game, they might lose it because he'll probably be moving up with his squad. Um, but to start the game, at least when night fighting's in effect, he'll be giving them fearless, and other units that can't take the vexilla, such as the um. Assault Marines or the Javelins that I like to run, they, mm. neither of them can take Vexillas and they both fall back 3d6 inches. So yeah. if they fall back in the first turn, they're off the table, most, most you know, deployment setups. So if they can start within the 12-inch bubble of him and if he can start an objective first turn, then that's usually what I try to go for with him. Interesting. Yeah. So he's, he's a big force multiplier. He doesn't, like, put out a bunch of damage, but... His warlord trait is so good. And, you know, he'll keep fighting, you know, the big 20-man blob till the last man, just holding up the opponent. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Really, really I found really handy. Um, oh, if we go on to his other special rule, he's got another one, of course, Brotherhood Betrayed, and this is just a really fluffy rule that never comes into effect, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he gets plus one weapon skill, plus one strength, and plus one toughness while locked in combat with any enemy model that has both the independent character and Legion is the uh, Emperor's Children special rule or any unit that such a model has joined. If an enemy model uh, that has both the independent character and Legion is the Emperor's Children special rule is removed as a casualty while locked in combat with Saul Tarvitz or a unit uh, he has joined, then Captain Saul Tarvitz controlling player gets plus one victory point in addition to any other that might be gained from this. Uh, this bonus is increased to two victory points if Captain Saltavis is removed. Uh, sorry, if Captain Lucius is removed as a casualty whilst engaged in a challenge with Captain Saltavis. Oh. So the chances of that happening are quite low because, as we'll see in a minute, Lucius is fucking bonkers. <laughs> but if you do happen to play against another um, Emperor's Children player, like any way to get a bonus victory point is fucking fantastic. Yeah. And he doesn't even have to be the model to kill him. So you can have your Maru Skara. Skara um, champion or phoenix warden in the unit who can you know do the killing work for um saul while he keeps his fearless bubble alive and still get that victory point even though saul isn't the one dealing yeah, the killing awesome. blow yeah Absolutely really good fucking love it yeah speaking of Lucius, and sorry all oh, right oh we haven't done his charnable yep. broadsword sorry. yeah his charnable broadsword so quickly run through this it's um plus two strength ap nothing melee rending four plus jewelous edge two two-handed and master crafted so against lucius he will go oh sorry in a duel he'll go up to initiative six mm. which i'm oh, sorry initiative seven which is fantastic yeah. i think that takes him equal with lucius but we'll see that in a moment strength six is really nice um rending four plus is fantastic um he's limited to four attacks because it's two-handed but yeah it's a really nice weapon nice and unique too the boy so Lucius was obviously known as one of the greatest swordsmen in all of the Legionis Astartes. Let's see if his um, he lives up to the hype. So he's a uh, weapon skill seven, which is a fantastic start. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. BS uh, BS five strength four toughness four three wounds initiative six. Again, a great start and uh, four attacks on his profile. So. Um, he has uh, 19 and the Blade of the Lair, Artificer Armor and Iron Halo and some grenades. Fantastic. So um, he has a lot of special rules. So he's Master of the Legion, which is good, because obviously you can take him um, as, uh, as like your Warlord and run Right of War. Um, he's Relentless. He has Preferred Enemy Independent Character, which is fucking bonkers. Precision Strikes, three up. Again, bonkers stubborn at leadership 10 which is fantastic um his supreme duelist and he is a traitor 
And you can also take Sonic Shriekers for 10 points, which, let's be honest, if you don't do that, you're some Every sort time. of fucking absolute lunatic. <laughs> so he can exchange the Blade of the Lair for a close combat weapon and drop his points to 175. But, like, what, what are you doing? Like, I think that's the way to go. Do you? Yeah. Because the Blade of the Lair is a... Um... Specialist, oh, specialist weapon. weapon. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, he gets an extra attack with just the hand yeah. weapon. And nineteen is and um nineteen is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. he has his own independent warlord trait, which is the blade alone. So if an army's warlord has this trait, then no other models or any units may use his leadership, regardless of any other rules or war gear that a unit may have. <laughs> However, whenever Captain Lucius is engaged in a challenge, all friendly models in the same combat gain the fearless special rule. In addition, the first reaction made in each game turn by Captain Lucius and any unit he's joined does not use up a point of the controlling player's reaction allotment. So you get double reactions and fearless if he's in a challenge. Yeah, similar to the champion, right? That's the same rule. The exactly, champion. yeah. And you notice these um, Emperor's Children trader characters are pretty selfish. They, um, yeah, bonus um, reactions are all for their own unit. Fulgrim, yeah, Fulgrim that's a good point. Lucius yeah, they're all point. just for their own unit. Yeah, really little bitches. They're not sharing. Yeah, uh, why have we not got the rules for 19 here, please, Robert? Oh, oh, I don't know. Should I? I'll find them and, and tell you what they are. Yeah, why not? Do apologize. It's I okay. thought it was an unusual. What was the do you know the rule, the, the story behind the. Uh, 19 is the name of the blade. It seems like an unusual name of a, of a sword. Well, there's a little bit of fluff here for you. Um, Lucius, famed for his overweening egotism, had little interest in the tools he used and wanted no simple blade to gain uh, a fame that approached his own. Despite the casual disinterest of its wielder, the blade referred to as 19 by Lucius was a masterwork of the smith's art and most likely taken as a trophy from some slain and forgotten opponent. Its oh, slender yeah. edge belied its strength and in Lucius's hands, it uh, it could block any attack aimed at the cocksure warrior. So essentially, he just named his weapons after numbers because he doesn't want anyone to know about him. Yeah. It's all about him, not his weapons. That's, that's really interesting. Cool. Okay, so 19. Yeah. So strength user, uh, AP dash, but his uh, melee weapon is rending three up. Julius Aegis. I'll come to that rule in a second. Julius Aegis one. Uh, Murder strike six up and master crafted uh so julius Aegis, a model with this special rule gains a bonus to their weapon skill equal to the value in brackets listed as part of the special rule whenever it is engaged in a challenge with an enemy model that is fucking bananas so he I mean, in weapon a skill eight weapon skill eight fuck my yeah. life which is the same as fulcrum right that's that's yeah Fulcrum. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, don't insane. forget yeah. don't forget as well you're also going to be an additional minus one to hit him for his sonic shriekers as well so yeah yeah. You ain't you ain't fucking, fucking touching him for shit. No way, no insane. way. Insane, yeah. And, and um, so... he's also got just one special rule that wasn't on the previous page: supreme duelist. Yeah, so sorry. while fighting in a challenge, if Captain Lucius's initiative characteristics he gets higher than his opponent, he gains plus one to his attacks. So it's oh. a kind of a mini version of what Fulgrim has. So you yeah. know he's so he's likely to be wild. going at sort of seven attacks. So you we're thinking yeah. fucking being off blow to the left, just a combat weapon. As much as it pains me to do it, <laughs> yeah, and just attack with nineteen. Yeah, I think well, so. You could, you could still take the blade of the layer if you want to, because he does have a pistol. So you could just use the pistol and yeah. nineteen for the bonus attack if you wanted to. But I think just like to save points, I would not take the blade of the layer. But if you want to just be you know ready for any kind of you want to situation, be that, maybe the blade of the layer could be handy. Yeah. yeah, I think what's quite concerning is that um, what, well, or at least the. At 175, with the rules that he has, even with 19, he's an absolute bargain. Like, yeah, he that, is, yeah. you know, that is just, it, he's less points than Loken, I think. I think Loken's at 180 yeah. or something. Um, and yeah, he's an absolute bargain. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah incredible. Well, absolutely. It'll awesome. be 185 when you give him the Sonic Shriekers, but it's still yeah. like a massive bargain. And, you know, we're talking about all these attacks he has and like the rending three up and stuff and the weapon skill eight. Don't forget that he has like preferred enemy in independent character. So he's re-rolling ones. He's yeah. hitting most people like on threes or like even twos if they're unit champions. And then you know he's got um, precision strike three plus. So if he's not in a challenge, he's just just taking out whoever he wants in that squad pretty much. Yeah, it's not, it's not such an absolute dick kicker. Love him. Absolutely fucking yeah. love him. Speaking of people who I don't love, right and off. <laughs> 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 
Go on. I mean, there is there is context for this, right? Which is that um, Telemachus. <laughs> yeah, Telemachus is, is so good for late. He's points. so good, and he's like a two month old fucking dreadnought, basically. You know, with a with a guy who's who's basically only been a legionary for like a couple of years, and Rylanor is an ancient of the legion, been there from the start. He is yeah. he he leads the induction of the uh, of scouts and new legionaries, doesn't he? And in comparison, yeah. he's just he's dog shit in comparison. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you really? remember at the start of the episode when I spoke about the proximal betrayal and saving yeah. the Emperor's life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking Rylanor was there. He was one ah. of those dudes. Ah. Ah. <laughs> he's, ca- he's carried the Emperor's personal standard. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so embarrassing for Rylanor, though. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Shameful. old Rylanor. Uh, but anyway. So, anyway. <laughs> I mean, he's he's just got done super dirty, hasn't he? Really dirty, yeah, John. Really he's dirty. Loads of points, and he's got a fucking assault cannon and yeah. a heavy yeah. flamer. What, what's his stats? Yeah. His weapons go, go through his stats because I can't see them at the moment. So, mate, you go. This, Kieran, this is your time to shine. Okay. Make your case for <laughs> my time to shine. Yeah. So, um, he's at two hundred and fifty points. So, ten points more than Telemachus. He yeah. Is, Movement eight, like a normal contemptor. Weapon skill five, BS five, like normal. Strength seven, toughness seven, like normal. Seven wounds, so he's got an extra wound. Okay, yeah. Initiative four, so regular initiative. Three attacks. Leadership nine, two up save. He's got a carries assault cannon. Grab his power fist with a built-in heavy flamer and an automatic def- uh, deflector. He yep. is rubbish. Um, but he's just. Yep, the, he yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. He's got uh, legions to save his emperor's children, loyalist and crusader. So. In comparison, for for ten points less, I can tell Emekarus has got weapon skill six. Yeah, and hatred everything. Four attacks and yeah. hatred everything. Yeah, yeah, it's just not a comparison, is it at all? <laughs> but, <laughs> anyone, anyone you, knows me, who you... knows me, knows that how <laughs> much that triggered me. So, <laughs> ever fucking take this guy over as a normal contender? Yeah, you yeah, just would take. Have him to be run. high. Yeah, like you, yeah. like oh my god. Anyway. An equally equipped Contemptor is what, like 180 points, 185 yeah. points. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and actually, the carries assault cannon is quite expensive, isn't it? It's 15 points, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, it's still ridiculous. Don't worry though, because he can take a dreadnought drop on. <laughs> oh, thank God. So, every cloud. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think that brings us to the to the end of of the kind of the run through of the of the Legion of the units. So, I think what we might. Uh, look to do is maybe do um, more of a sort of a tactical deep dive on certain elements and some list building over on the Patreon. We've got a few things that we want to kind of get through, but I think it would make sense for it to to kind of exist over there. Um, so uh, uh, speaking of um, Patreon, we have the the role of honour. You can tell how popular the Praetor level tier has become because we've had to make the font incredibly small <laughs> in order to get everyone on. Yeah. So um, as we said at the start of the show, um, like we're super grateful for everyone that subscribes to um, to the Patreon, like it really does um, help us out with a, a bunch of stuff, including kind of getting us to events and um, yeah. like equipment and stuff and bits and pieces to kind of be able to put the shows together. Um, if you want to help out, you can head over to patreon.com and search for Heresy Hammer. It's a three pounds a month to kind of get started. But these uh, fine ladies and gentlemen in front of you have subscribed at the Praetor tier. So they will be the first recipients of the custom Siege Breaker alongside all the other swag and all the other bits and bobs and the chance to win a model that me, Rob or Lee would have painted and all the event materials, etc. So... Without further ado, we would say super thanks to uh, Lewis Hibbins, um, Mark Gallagher, Matthew Fuller, Ethan Brull, Big T Painting, Callum Falcus, Clayton Unru, WH underscore Black Panzer, Craig the Celt, Kevin uh, Abramo, um, Nicholas Drax, Andrew G, that guy Lazar, David Walker, Saigon Sadler, Chris Levitt, Julian, Mark Ainsworth, Dale Barrett, um, Ian, uh, Kerry Love, uh, Alex Robinson, Tom Spear, uh, Aaron, who is Hammer Nails 40k, Richard Harris, Cathonic Water Beast, Josh, um, Simon Whitehouse, Pete King, Ashley Bowley, Pete Day, Al, Randy Overland, um, Igor Povolotsky, who we want to congratulate for being the second recipient of our uh, console draw. 
Uh, Bradley Slutes, Patrick Greenstreet, Cody Sivertson, Mike Dorset Wolf, Richard Willis, Tom Hayward, Neil Atherton, Ben Robinson, Walter Cook the Fourth, Ben Ide, Gore Crow, Lupercalia EX, John McArdle, and Thomas Silverstrin. To name but a few. Um, and with that, we also need to say some additional thank you to our sponsors. So Cryptic Cabin, um, they've been here since the very beginning. Um, if you want to purchase your Horace Heresy products, then you can use the link in the description or on all of our social platforms. You can get a bit of discount um, and speedy delivery throughout the UK. Um but not just for heresy products. If you've got any other kind of hobby, they stock a, like a really quite a wide range of other hobby products now as well. Uh, some of which uh, we'll be using on Rob's painting courses that are coming up. So Absolutely. Rob, would you, anything that you need to specifically plug at the moment? Uh, so we've got the basing and weathering course in a couple of weeks time, maybe a week and a bit. Um, it's a couple of spaces, lots still open for that. If you want to come join us in Derby, it'll be a fun day, messy day, but a uh, fun, uh, fun day smashing weathering powders into bases and learning some tricks of the trade. Um, and yeah, that's the course. So I've got a Kratos course, uh, which is sold out for, um, I think it's July or August from what I recall. Um, and I will maybe, I had kind of thought that that would be the end of the courses for the year, but I might do some in the autumn and winter, depending on availability. So keep an eye out on the socials. So that's at Meadows Miniatures over on Instagram. Yes. Um, bits Monster. So again, if you've got uh, bits of kits that you need, you don't want to be buying whole big boxes, you just want a certain character or a certain bit of a character out of a box and head over to Bits Monster. So you can head over to bitsmonster.com for the, the online store. Follow them on Facebook at bits.monster and Instagram at bits.monster. Um, they offer free shipping over £25, which is fucking wild. Um, and their international shipping rates are really reasonable as well. I know a few people have we've contacted saying thanks very much because they've started ordering from uh, elsewhere. So, Kieran, if you ever need any bits and bobs, hit these guys up, <laughs> especially because if you sure. use the code yeah. Heresy Hammer at checkout, then you'll get um, 10% off all your Horace Heresy stuff, which is, again, wonderful. Um, Dan, good old Dan, Gated 3D. Um, so um, it's like a 3D print on demand service has a huge extensive range of, um, of files has helped us out loads with um, bits and bobs for our events as well. Um, so we need to say special thanks for doing that. And um, if you come to our events, you'll get some Gator 3D printed goodies in all of your goodie bags. Um, but yeah, Dan does a phenomenal job Print some stuff up for me recently and uh, quality was absolutely top draw. So get along to Gator 3D. And in the same vein, also um, Beowulf miniatures printing as well. Again, a real eclectic mix of kind of different bits and pieces you won't necessarily see elsewhere. Um, if you're attending uh, Lee's event, which is next weekend. This this weekend, this weekend. The coming weekend, yep. then um, they will be there on the Sunday showing off all of their wares. So make sure you bring some spare pennies with you. But in the meantime, check out... Um, bearwolfminiatures.com or Beowulf Miniature Printing on Instagram and Facebook for all your print-on-demand needs. And then finally, before we go, um, don't forget to keep um, submitting your images on Instagram using the hashtag HeresyHammer. We're going to do... Uh, our next show is not going to be kind of quite so intense, so we're going to go through some more hashtag HeresyHammers. When I'm hoping have... for the next show um, that we look at the Siege of Cthonia book. That's the that's my my dream. So we might have a bit more flexibility about what we look at. So. Absolutely. Yeah, it, we had to be, obviously, um, recording with Kieran, being that he's, you know, oh, the entirety of the other side of the world from us, we had to be a little bit kind of more careful about kind of when we did it. So it's quite a slightly different show this week. But I think you'll all agree that it's been a, a wonderful show. And thanks so much to Kieran again for giving up yes. his time to come Kieran. talk to us about his passion for Empress Children. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, which we assume you are, then um, please do give it a thumbs up. It really does help out. Um, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. It doesn't cost a penny. Um, make sure to kind of leave a comment, discuss what you like, what you want to see kind of coming up. If you're an Empress Children player, are you kind of happy with where the kind of where you think you sit at the moment? What tricks and tips have we missed out on? What do we need to kind of cover in the Tactica special? And obviously, please share it amongst your friends, family, and colleagues at work. Um, if you've got any lists you would like us to discuss or anything you want to kind of raise with us, any kind of comments and feedback, then please email us at uh, heresyhammer30k at gmail.com. 
And lastly, if you would like to get double the Heresy Hammer you normally do alongside all of the other stuff that we already do and that we've got planned um, and you want to show your super special support for the show, then um, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Heresy Hammer or heading to patreon.com and searching Heresy Hammer. And um, thank you very much. I think, gents, that's, that's is, it. That's all. That's Thank all you. Much. We know everything about the Third Legion now. We can put them onto bed. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. Until the next time, we shall see you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.